Gather round, freaks. This month, what we've done is we picked the grimoire up to read out of it, and a bunch of pages fell out. And this month's uh, page was all greasy and covered in blood and viscera. And, you know, gather around the internet fire and gather around the internet radio because we're bringing you the top quality show that happens each and every week here live on Twitch. It's hey. Did you see this one? With its covers tightly sealed and nightmares lurking within, the ancient book stirs ominously, whispering of unspeakable horrors and twisted sacrifices that have plagued the brave souls who dared to peek inside. But beware, for one of our sinister hosts has made a ghastly discovery. As the yellow pages were last turned, a malevolent truth unraveled. Pages are missing. Each one leading to a dark realm far more terrifying than the tome itself. A place where madness reigns, monstrous abominations lurk, and mayhem consumes all who venture too deeply. This chilling revelation serves as a stark reminder that monsters manifest in a myriad of forms. And hey, did you see this one? Invites you to brave the darkest corners of mind, matter, and mystery in search of the grimoire of familiar killers. Lost Pages. What a spooky intro. Hello, everybody. Hello. It's Thursday night at 8 p.m. Eastern here on Twitch and YouTube and anywhere you get your podcasts. Maybe it's also in the future. But this is, hey, did you see this one? The weekly uh, movie roundtable discussion review reaction podcast video <laughs> movie. Um, we uh, have started a new month. Thank you for everybody who came through last month for our uh, Feminist Masterpiece Theater. We had two guests on each and every week. But we are back to one guest only uh who i'll talk about in a moment here my name is jason r phillips i'm joined as always by my illustrious uh, uh co-host uh also host we're co-hosts he's not i'm not the host anyway uh steven h r geiger waters no. from the future that's me uh, we are the new month is the uh grimoire familiar killers which is a uh, you know bi-yearly thing that we do have been covering friday the 13th freddy goes to hell jason goes to hell chucky goes to hell all those movies coming up in october we're going to be talking about the sixth iteration of all those films but this month is the lost pages where we wanted to do like a horror month okay. and talk about some one-off movies that sort of have the same energy as like a as like a Friday the Thirteenth slasher, um, and then we kind of threw that out of the window, and we're just doing four 
like horror movies, I think is what we ended up with. Nightbreed, I think, of the four falls well into that. Uh, that is the movie we're covering this week, and we are congratulating our guest this week <laughs> who's returning to the show. He is a host on the Hollywood Suite television channel, podcasts, uh, internet present. Please welcome back to the show. It's Cam Maitland. Hi, guys. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. Hello to all my fans in movie land. <laughs> Thank you for coming back, Cam. Um, it's good to see you. Uh, the last time I saw you was at a garden party on the weekend, and we'll leave it at that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I may have been overserved. I think you overserved <laughs> yourself before you got to the function, but that's cool. That we like to have a good time. Uh, <laughs> Nightbreed, uh, folks. Uh, that is the movie we were talking about this week. Uh, I think before we get to anything, as far as the movie goes, let's talk about our brief history with the film. A brief history! And here on Hey Did You See This One, the guest has the first word in most matters. So, Cam, why don't you give us your uh, brief history with Nightbreed? Sure. I, I have, like, a, a bit of a weird history with, with the weird movie Nightbreed uh, in that <laughs> I first um, dealt with it through a book, uh, which was at my local library called The Nightbreed Chronicles which was mostly like an art book slash a book looking at all the makeup, um, oh. showing all the monsters. Uh, so I saw that book well before I like knew what the movie was and well before I would probably watch scary movies as a kid. There was like a fantasy and sci-fi art section in our library. I don't know. So I really liked the monsters and eventually, yeah, I got to see it. It was well before... Uh, the cabal cut and stuff well before any of these new cuts which we'll get into i'm sure uh and yeah kind of a movie that is nonsense in its original form but i do th like i understand why people like it and why people are compelled by it because it does for instance like we were talking about in the pre-show you are like yeah they could make a tv show of it there's so many dangling threads even in the studio cut that you're just like Oh, yeah, like, you know, it's like modern franchise poisoned film because it just seems to be the first in a series that never happened. So that kind of sticks in your mind. And and since then, I, I the first Cabal Cut, when that came out, it played a TIFF. I went to it there with a bunch of the makeup artists uh, in attendance. And then, yeah, then this week I saw the director's cut for the first time, and I took a swing at the... Uh, nightmare <laughs> ultimate cut that steve did and uh, yeah i'm not that much of a fan <laughs> me neither but for some reason i still did i mean i'm did curious uh, like yeah. i i do think that uh i can close my grimoire of <laughs> is there a good version of this movie <laughs> now uh yeah like uh, yeah that's it Nice. All right. Uh, I think we're going to have a good conversation because it, just just before we can actually, you know what, Steve, go ahead and let us know about which version of the movie you watched. Also, I guess if you weren't going to already. Well, I was going to do that during my brief history, so I'll do yeah, that. Cool. Um, actually, like Cam, I was familiar uh, of the the monsters and makeup from a book when I was a kid as well, but I had no idea what it was. <clears throat> And years went by and I, you know, like so many movies from that I watched way too young, it uh, it felt like a dream. Like I had, I had conjured these images up in my mind, uh, but it was it was planted there from some book that I looked at. I was a weird monster kid, so people would get me monster stuff when I was a kid. And uh, often like Hollywood makeup books were a thing that were floating around in my house all the time. Um, but actually, the first time I watched this was on recommendation from my friend Cam Maitland. When we had... <laughs> yeah. When we first met, we were we were working together mm. and, uh, you know, it was kind of before we started hanging out, before we sort of became friends. We were in that that moment of like befriending somebody where you're just learning their interests. And this was one of the things that you had recommended to me, uh, specifically the Cabal Cut. And mm. uh, on your recommend, re recommendation, I watched it and I was like, OK, Cam gets the weird shit that I'm into. <laughs> Cam knows what I like. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that was the first time that I watched that. It was probably in like 2015 or so. So it was before the, or it might have been 
close to when the uh, the director's cut came out but uh yeah. before the 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 nightmarishly long version that i watched yesterday um three and a half hours of a lot more and a lot less somehow but uh yeah the ultimate cut we'll talk about it when we talk about it but uh i don't know if i can recommend it <clears throat> that's my brief history and you watched the the longest possible version i watched the yeah. ultimate cabal cut is what it is <sighs> Yeah, Which is, so, is kind of unofficial, I think, because it seems like they put it together, but it lost funding, and there's kind yeah. of no release of it beyond YouTube and streaming and stuff. And it, it also, also kind of feels a little bit unfinished, which I'll... Yeah, yeah. And I mean... The I irony. Think, <laughs> yeah, and I do think that the, like, because the director's cut is, like, Clive Barker had all the elements and was allowed to do what he wanted to do. It's kind of like, how much further do you need to go? Yeah, so yeah, for me it's it's basically like Steve so Steve mentioned that he wanted to do a grimoire lost pages for this show pretty much since he joined the show 2 years ago, 3 years ago. And shortly after we came up with the idea for the grimoire, that's when you started kind of pitching the idea for this month. We didn't get around to it till now because we ended up doing the two grimoires per year blah 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 whatever. Last year, you sent me the trailer for this movie, and I've been fascinated by the trailer mm -hmm. for a year because it doesn't make any sense. It's just a <laughs> mm -hmm. pictures of crazy things and crazy monsters and crazy makeup and crazy practical effects happening. And I think about it all the time, but I wanted to make sure that we did this for the, the Grimoire Lost Pages month, so I didn't watch it until this week. And we had a chat. We have a group chat, the three of us. And we were talking about which version should I watch, guys? <laughs> and you guys basically said, watch all the versions, yeah. the long and short of it. <laughs> or none of watch. them. Yeah, or or none I of mean, them. the other thing that's interesting is, like, you. It, I don't know how you would watch, like, the first version I watched. That version is essentially scrubbed from the world at this point, so, I think. Ba yeah, so the theatrical release, basically, you were like, that version is seen as kind of the worst version and also hard to find. The theatrical version... Or the director's cut, sorry, is the version that sort of is the like, this is the introduction version, like watch this. Mm -hmm. And then there's a cabal cut and then an ultimate cabal cut, which is like yeah. bonus scenes. Yeah, and I mean, the movie. part of it's kind of a mess because like the cabal cut was made, the first cabal cut that I went to at TIFF was made with what they thought were all the elements they had available. Then almost immediately, I think... I think Clive Barker might have been there or somebody said, hey, we're showing you this cut, but we just in a castle <laughs> that some musician works in found a ton more stuff. We found a so, video camera. With that yeah, just well, I think that they, they essentially found all shot footage that yeah, it okay. seems like. They found uh, like like ninety percent of the original yeah, uh, film film prints, and they were because the uh, director's cut is all film. There's nothing looking janky. Yeah. Whereas even the Cabal cut I saw at TIFF had some of those VHS elements that I think still exist in the Ultimate cut. Yeah, you know, it's like, like it's I think, like alternate takes and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I think it's also like suspicious that it was found immediately it was probably like they realized oh we can maybe make more money yeah <laughs> yeah I, the, well uh... i do also think as we've touched on kind of that uh you know clive barker being near death for the past like decade yeah. uh he's tried to go back and like save a few because i think um hellbound hellraiser 2 also has a different cut that okay. he did yeah. um yeah i don't know so i think he's sometimes trying to salvage the projects that were kind of taken away from him and you know not up to his standard yeah we'll see what we'll see what the uh the posthumous like ultimate versions of these movies are once oh, he yeah. passes and and we get a you know some sort of collection but for this movie like i said i just watched the uh director's cut over the last couple of days i watched in two hour long sittings um and i had my finger on the ultimate cabal cut and today steve was like i watched it it's uh maybe not the version you need to see so i'm glad I, that i made the decision I but i'm glad that we have watch, i never recommend watching movies in chunks i'm i'm a i'm anti chunk movie watching i say watch it <laughs> except for the go. goonies am i right steve <laughs> then you're, oh, yeah. then you're pro then i'm pro chunk yeah mm. uh but uh, this one i couldn't do it i had to take breaks because it was too much to handle <laughs> 
Yeah. 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 And I mean, I tried, I tried 10 or 15 minutes of that ultimate cut and it's, yeah, you you can just tell it's like, oh, this is just trimmed. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just stretching scenes on for so long. And then sometimes it's like, yeah, we have no sound elements. So it's just going to show the script. Like, okay. There's a, yeah. there's a difference between a shooting screen. It's essentially an assembly cut, which is interesting. Like, I don't know a single other movie where they've done that. Mm -hmm. uh, but, yeah. X-Men Origins Wolverine without the CGI effects. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that sure. it appeared on the internet. Yeah, it's, uh, the mummy where there's no <laughs> sound <laughs> except the screaming audio, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we'll do a month of those and then no, lose no, our six no. six viewers that we have. Already. I mean, save it for uh, Empire of the Planet of the Apes when they're releasing the all humans, no CGI <laughs> ape, cut, which, they, which they said they're doing. So oh yeah, that should be interesting. Uh, great. Uh, so we have discussed whether or not we want to actually continue doing the director talk segment unless it's pertinent. And I think this month it is pertinent so let's do a little bit of director talk all right all right quiet on set are we rolling okay let's shoot this piece of shit. sound speed action <laughs> so this month is kind of special or this week is kind of special because clive barker uh you know famously known for the um hellraiser films uh, he wrote this book and he also directed this movie. So me and Steve were kind of talking about this before the show. And it's not one of those situations where he took a, a, a property and sort of did his adaptation. This like he just did several versions of his vision of this book that he wrote. Kind mm. of. Right. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. It's actually I, I yeah. I took some time to watch the documentary on it, too, to kind of understand more what up but yeah it does really seem like he's doing different versions and i do think he was always somebody who was like a little mindful of what will and won't fly <laughs> in a movie both due to technological limitations and then also knowing that like you know look at his adaptation of hellraiser i, I think it's like he knows how freaky he can get pretty much <laughs> yeah how edgy he can be i and yeah I, I haven't read uh cabal but i have i've read a few of his other Me books neither. And um, it that's exactly it. Like you, I read um, Scarlet Gospel, which is one of his Hellraiser books, and just the stuff that he writes, you're like, you can't, you would never be able to do this, even with the advancement of CGI. Mm -hmm. But if you truly, if you wanted to do it with practical effects, which I think he's a big proponent, proponent of or, or fan of, uh, you wouldn't be able to do it. <laughs> you just couldn't. Um, even even imagining it when he's describing it to you as thoroughly as he can in the books, it's difficult to to truly understand what he's getting at at some points um but i you know i, I like his world building more than anything else his mm -hmm. his actual novels i don't find to be all that compelling but the stuff that he's building it within it i do like um i i've often thought that a lot of the world building that he does would be really well suited for video games even nightbreed really could make yeah a video uh -huh. game. um <clears throat> I, I think, think that this I think he did have a video game in the early 2000s. Yeah, I think he's had a couple actually. He's yeah, uh, yeah he's kind of a multimedia dude. Mm -hmm. I think it cool. with this with this film he made a very successful John Carpenter film. <laughs> they, it, this this has that vibe kind of going. I mean, on. all of his movies feel like John Carpenter films, but at the same time, you could say the same thing about John Carpenter. That's White true. Person. And what I was going to say is that it feels like if a, if a John Carpenter movie halfway through becomes Hellraiser. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like the the beginning with the police and the like, sort of the setup for the uh, for the story feels very like a John Carpenter film, and then it sort of starts to bleed into that the vibe you get from that first hell first and second Hellraiser movies where it just starts to get kind of sticky. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> the movie gets very like what is gooey. Uh, literally gooey. Yeah. goo coming out of every orifice. Yeah, and, uh, I yeah it's. It, it, it's interesting. And I do think actually one of the most fascinating things watching the kind of short documentary that came out recently with one of the cuts is that uh, Doug Bradley brings up who is the pinhead. And then in this, he's the kind of Moses guy. Um, he's got that, gills on his face. <laughs> yeah, they're eyeballs, but you don't find out till way too late. Oh, really yeah. cool. <laughs> You're like, oh, this is cool. Right. Yeah. As he's a, a corpse dying. Um, yeah. yeah the, but uh, he pointed out that they shot. Hellraiser, Hellraiser 2, and Nightbreed within basically three years. 
So like, um, yeah, they don't, you know, they don't do that anymore. No, but he also is like, it's, it's a miracle any of them happened. Like, don't ask me to remember anything. Uh, he talks about how it was like, he's like, my character wasn't that important, but it was very hard to be in character because essentially he's like, I was uh, getting in a car at the same time, taking the same route with the same makeup artist as being Pinhead, but I wasn't Pinhead. So he's like, I had to find a way to like prepare myself because it was all the Pinhead stuff. And you have to um, be in, you have to be in makeup for... Oh yeah, I mean, uh, our our man. Apparently, the guy, the the grimoire I come to talk about, Craig Schiffer, had to be in it for seven hours for that cabal makeup because it's also so early on in makeup technology that, like, yeah, most of these guys were in it forever. So I also think, you know, that you can definitely knock this movie sometimes for how cheap it looks, but I think it's also like they were they were stretching the budget as much as they possibly could. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a question for you guys that you may know the answer to that I wasn't sure. Did they use um, miniatures uh, a bunch in this? Because it seemed like when the truck crashes through the wall, like near the end and goes falls down, it looks like a miniature set. Also, those bridges looked like obviously yeah, there's, there's, there's tons of miniatures. Yeah, in this movie. Yeah, I would say there's miniatures, but I also they also kind of all talked about that that the big Midian set with the bridges was built at Pinewood and was pretty huge. Like they kind of say it was astonishing, and and like I mean, I guess Doug Bradley's probably one of the bigger actors. Although Craig Sheffer's been in a lot of stuff, and most of them said that it it was kind of the biggest, grandest set they ever worked on in their entire careers. That's wild. Mm -hmm. Comparatively, mm -hmm. like Hellraiser One um, is a pretty small. Like there's the house mm -hmm. is really the whole set piece, and that weird hallway that goes to hell or wherever. Yeah, there's not a whole lot, so that was probably quick. Uh, but that's a headier concept even than Nightbreed. Nightbreed, though, the magic of this film is that it, it seems like every time they do shots of Midian, there's a different monster. There's mm -hmm. a new monster. Yeah. And I imagine in that three-hour cut, we kind of discussed this. <laughs> I'll tell uh, you right now, the three-hour cut, the introduction to Midian when uh, when our, when our the female protagonist is making her way down through into Midian is mm. so long it's <laughs> long it's so long to the point that you you're get looking bored. around corner you're like you're like, like i don't even monsters. care anymore i i've seen all the monsters <laughs> yeah. i need let me just i mean even in the director's off. cut it's it's borderline the start of beauty and the beast of like bon bonjour <laughs> like uh, uh, sorry just a monster walking here yeah like, yeah. Uh, um, yeah very strange but i mean this is also you know the, the early 90s and all through the 80s and even the 70s science fiction and horror movies they've all had they all had these not all of them but like a, a large percentage of them have what i like to call the cantina sequence which mm. is when luke skywalker first goes into the cantina in star wars and it's like you know da -da 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 -da, and you're just seeing all the different aliens that's basically what this scene is uh except it's gross monsters that are <laughs> bleeding everywhere barfing up their own food and then eating it again or whatever uh a, a tit man just made of tits but uh, you also have, you know, the Star Wars Cantina, but, you know, like Mad Max and uh, name it if you got it. I was going to ask you guys if you have like a favorite. Oh, cantina I mean, I love uh, <laughs> another Cantina movie I like a lot is Freaked, the Alex Winter okay. one, uh, yeah. where they're all it's all basically creatures. And it, but it's a completely stupid comedy that just overdoes it way hard with creatures. And I know Alex Winter apparently has a new one on Shudder that's also very creature heavy. And it's just that messed me up. That movie messed me up as a kid. It used to be on late at night all the time. And I remember tuning in and being like, this is not for my eyes, but yeah. I'm going to look at the person with the giant nose and he's part of a, he's part of a, a twin with a person he hates. And it just, yes. it's, crazy it's also the the thing that i actually think nightbreed unfortunately did not do enough of is uh slimy <laughs> the, <laughs> the nightbreed is too dry they gotta yeah. get some uh some wet on them but yeah I, and i do think that the like he cared a lot it's obvious because that's this book the nightbreed chronicles which looks like you can get for about 40 bucks used uh is essentially like studio portraits of every single monster basically oh, cool. every single black background player it's what if people would know it from anything it's the cute studio portrait of cronenberg and clive parker holding the little worms that's from the nightbreed chronicle okay i would say my favorite like to answer your question my favorite monster from this is i think that was the question right no sure but i mean oh. if you wanted to say that too you can yeah. 
<laughs> well, my favorite monster is trying to figure out if the dude's head is a moon on purpose, or if that's just the way his head goes, or if he uh. is a moon. But I do like the I do like the reveal that that one weirdo has the like tentacles that come out from his gut. Yeah, and I was like, that's a that's, that's a Beetlejuice action figure. <laughs> I feel like a lot of people are trying to give that performance, and that's the one guy who actually kind of does the performance of like a a weirdo wisecracking perv. Yeah, yeah. Who's he, maybe in a relationship should... with that, like the devil guy? Yeah. <laughs> like, are they married? Yeah. 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 He should be in that scene when Beetlejuice goes into, he gets to the, or the, you know, the, the couple waiting room. the afterlife. Well, that, that's my room. answer, actually. There with this weird. Oh, yeah. That was yeah, I mean, all of Beetlejuice uh, afterlife is pretty good. Yeah. Um, J- the question, Jason, was do you have a favorite Star Wars mm. canteen moment where it's like, showing oh, a bunch of creatures? My answer was going to be the Beetlejuice waiting room. So, um, now we got that out. Favorite I think mine would also be Beetlejuice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Two two Beetlejuices and a freaked. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. <laughs> I was just saying freaked should be cool, but it's probably also Beetlejuice. <laughs> yeah. I do like the uh, the Thunderdome Mad Max when he first gets to uh, Junk Town or whatever. That mm. was pretty fun too. Um, but as for a favorite monster, I don't know. It's hard for me. Like the monsters are really cool in this, but it seems like you know they showcase the coolest ones, and then like you start to see the other ones, and you're like. They probably didn't spend a lot of time. Yeah, his face uh, is just up right yeah, down. These guys valid. got, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, a lot of these guys got weird eyes. <laughs> or yeah, like, top, top for some reason, blue, bottom they, they found a way to build the, like, you got a tiny upper top and then your legs are attached. <laughs> There's like three or four of those guys. I did uh, like the one guy who's like, he's super tall and his bottom just gets really big and he's kind of yeah. like walking out and he just kind of like makes a noise at, at her as she walks by. Like, yeah. I like that guy. And the guy whose head is like in his belly. That's the guy yeah. on the, yeah. the cover of the book. But I, yeah, I think, I, I think, I mean, the problem is that they, they truly did uh, go real hard on a couple creatures. So yeah. like, I'm a big, like Shuna Sassy, the porcupine lady. So you kind of wish she was in it more, but she's pretty awesome. And actually, you know what? Like, I think one of the, because they're not always supported by great performances, but I do think one of the great performances is the weird mom who, like, right, turns yeah. people into, you know, dust. She's, like, made of acid or something. Yeah, She's cool. There's yeah. Some... She's the horny one. <laughs> Spiky. Yeah. Uh, I also like, uh, what's his name, like, Poli- Pel- Peliquin? Peliquin, Peliquin, sure. Yeah. Peliquin I think he's cool too. I like that he transforms yeah. and like when he goes. See, I feel like I could have done without the transformation. I like I like him. Like he's a very interesting character, and obviously mm-hmm. again the unfortunate thing of like, man, Peliquin's really gonna pop off in the sequels. <laughs> but um, right, yeah, yeah. I, I feel up. like the transformation just because he's such a like he's a horrible weird monster to begin with. That's true. Yeah. So he transforms into a like a bump head weird monster. The other problem I think is two shows. Namely, Star Trek The Next Generation and Buffy the Vampire Slayer, where I feel like half of these things look like rejects from those shows, where it's just like, something's fucked up with your forehead, something's (laughs) fucked up with your eyes, like, just very little appliances. But I I do know, um, for instance, the I can't remember the guy's name, but the guy that's kind of the little freak with the dog, uh, he he said that he had, like... uh, he had almost no makeup, so everybody hated him because he could just roll in at like a normal hour and yeah. actually sleep. Uh, but he said that the punishment he got was he had to learn to do his own makeup and he had yeah. to put nipples on and they were just like, we don't have time for you. You have to learn to put these on. And he's like, okay. And he said, yeah, like a lot of the people were doing their own makeup because it's just like they maxed out a makeup house hardcore because there's like four or five major makeups almost every single day. I was watching a video today and it was this guy was like some familiar faces from Nightbeat Breed that you might recognize. And then he names like Doug Bradley and then shows Pinhead and then mm. the eyeball face guy. And then he shows that dude. And then he's like, like Chatterer, right? He's one of them. No, he's like the big butterball. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yes. the goggles on. I'm like, they don't look there, the same at all. <laughs> there are a lot of centibites in this movie because you're like, yeah. who are these actors? And I mean, to go back to director talk, I guess another interesting thing I learned, which I didn't really know, was. Clive Barker, before he was a writer, was like a theater director, and him and Doug Bradley had worked together a lot before that. And actually, a lot of Nightbreed, I think even beyond Hellraiser, is a bunch of this kind of fringe artistic theater troupe he had uh, on screen, which is kind of cool. And so, like, Mm -hmm. because, yeah, a lot of these actors are like, I've never heard of these people, (laughs) but a lot of them are kind of interesting British theater people that he called up and was like, hey, I 
want you to be a weird little freak. And I assume Peliquin's in there somewhere because he definitely sounds like a British guy doing it. Peliquin is, sense. yeah, I think Peliquin yeah. was uh, was a pretty fancy. I'm trying to think Peliquin and and oh, the guy who um, cuts his face off. That oh, really? guy is that guy's like a Royal Shakespeare Company, you know. He feels like, like Stratford upon Avon, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's got a very particular delivery to most of his lines. Yes, even though he's doing like let's all ask to love yeah. a police. How the hell are you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like it should be David Johansson, but it's not. <laughs> right. Yeah. He's With like constantly... most of his skin on his head just gone. <laughs> yeah. He's usually smoking a cigarette or chewing gum. You're like, these mm. are the most American things I can think of over yeah. here. <laughs> over here. Yeah. I'm walking. Uh, do we want to move into the uh, the body of the episode? Is there any, anything else you want to add about Clive Barker, the man, the myth? The I legend? mean, uh, yeah, I, I do think that like coming out of this, I'm definitely left like, uh, I don't know. I will say the cool thing is like, well, again, these behind the scenes stuff, everybody had a good time. All the actors talk about how like great he is preparing you with your character. So they all had like these deep kind of character connections. Uh, but I just don't know. I, I think I think he never really got there. Like I do think a lot of these movies stick with you. And I I'm even pretty defensive of Lord of Illusion, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, other than maybe casting Scott Bakula. But uh <laughs> but I do yeah. think that none of them are like perfect. Like even my love of Hellraiser, that's a cheap looking movie that's got yeah. kind of a weird third act uh that is just like lucky to be as great as it is and i do think that nightbreed like a lot of what we're complaining about with the makeup is like lighting and and camera choices yeah. uh, i think um yeah. I, I agree but also hellraiser it's wet cam just like you asked for it's so goo. true yeah <laughs> so much goo. maybe they just ran out of goo <laughs> Yeah, they they spent their goo budget on the Hellraisers, and they're like, we yeah. got more goo left. Yeah, and I mean, also when I, whenever you're talking about cheapness, I always think of there's a part in Hellraiser two where they're going into hell, and the right. set visibly goes like more because <laughs> it's like <laughs> it's like obviously a painted <laughs> background, but you can get into it. Like I do think again, you're right. The world building, who cares? Like the fact that Midian looks like a weird painting slash model kind of works and adds to the weirdness of this movie. Yeah, um, that wide shot, the matte painting of mid, the, the graveyard of Midian, especially later in the movie when it's like on fire, that yeah. effect was actually really well done. Yeah. Like it looks really nice. It yes. doesn't look too cheap. You can obviously see what's happening, but it doesn't, you know, squint yeah. a little. It's an old, it's an old video yeah. game. And it's yeah. also very hard to be like, like the other thing is for any of how cheap this looks, I think it's probably him stretching the budget to the absolute max. Like, it probably looks way better than that budget would allow for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know? The budget is, like, shockingly low as well. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think he, got, by this point, he was kind of doing a, you know, give me X amount of money and let me do whatever I want. Right. Uh, yeah. Because, yeah, the, well, I, I don't know. I normally do that in this segment. Steve, do you have numbers? Do you have... 11, uh, 11 million is how much it costs, and it made 16, so not, well, not a lot. That's not a sequel, but that is a well. We we pulled off a robbery. <laughs> yeah, and I do think I do think uh, like I'm pretty sure I've read also that he kind of left. He he was not ever in like director's jail. He more moved on to do other stuff. I do know that a lot of his '90s was sucked up. Uh, he was tried to develop. I think maybe Weave World for Disney. He tried to do like because he has a lot of teen content that right. really hasn't been adapted. Uh, and I know that, yeah, that took up like most of his 90s. And then I think, like you say, he made two video games. He made so many more books and stuff. And yeah, produced a lot. A of lot. It, I didn't really consider it until you just said that. But like even the, the Scarlet Gospel, like the final Hellraiser book that he made, does feel very like YA with a lot of R-rated content in it. Mm -hmm. just, the writing style in general just kind of feels a little bit, not amateur, but geared towards just... Some more like, uh, yeah, like readable, you know, like yeah. I think Stephen King's the same, right? Like it's not trying right. to uh, use $10 words. And I do know, uh, like, I don't know if this is maybe for later in the episode, but there was a comics series that he really did seem to really oversee that was right. well hated, but it also did a crossover with Hellraiser in like 1991 cool. called Jihad. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> which uh, apparently sucks so hard <laughs> and it's like borderline indecipherable but uh great cool idea track that down comic book lover yeah i think that they're Weirdos. all they're all uh, bound somewhere but you can find it on amazon for like a buck because every <laughs> it's like one star what the hell is this? <laughs> i might have to find this i think that there are also a later good set of nightbreed comics so i don't know right okay well, I guess we should move into the movie itself. 
in the body of the episode. The body of the episode. <laughs> I'd like to say that I know I said that my favorite monster in this movie was the moon face man mm. but blink and you'll miss it i think that it's it should be noted that uh cory taylor from slipknot was absolutely in the background of a lot of these shots <laughs> i mean cory uh, taylor from slipknot is the bad guy isn't he <laughs> right well that's what i was gonna say uh uh cronenberg's character dr decker mm -hmm. that um that mask looks like a melding of all of oh, all yeah. three of Corey taylor's most famous masks and i was spending the whole time going did did slipknot get a lot of inspiration from this movie also there's one scene where they do the cartoon thing where they go down from the from like the 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 ground level through the ground, and you see a mummy in a coffin, yep. like the like cartoons do. <laughs> well, it's just <laughs> like, to let you know that it's a crypt. You know? it's a, yeah, it's a mausoleum. I thought uh, that was a really full funny of touch. Mummy. The Simpsons has done that gag probably a thousand times. Oh, yeah. um, just for one that I was thinking of. Usually it's like dinosaur bones and then like in, in, in like a, a UFO. But like I was I was blown away by that. Um also for the body of the episode, I've I've asked our favorite AI to just give us a sort of scene by scene summary. So instead of me reading out every single fact through the movie, I'm just gonna kind of go act by act. And these they're not really acts, they're more of just like chunks of the movie. The, the beginning of this movie is the a version dream I sequence. watched have has 18 acts. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, the version you watched would have killed AI. Like AI would <laughs> well, be I'm done wondering... it would be like, does not compute. The human mind creates monsters. <laughs> I haven't fully read through this, and I'm wondering if this, I'm wondering how this is going to stack up to all the different versions. But basically, this the movie opens with a dream sequence. Boone dreams of monstrous creatures in a place called Midian. And then we see him in the doctor's office discussing his dreams with the therapist, Dr. Decker, who insists uh, Boone is repressing violent tendencies. And that's basically the the opening of this movie. Yeah, I mean, the version that I've watched, uh, there's a sequence that I, I guess didn't have finalized audio. So it's, it's basically the two okay. characters talking to each other. Oh, yeah. At first, I was like, are they using telepathy? <laughs> I thought they were like speaking <laughs> to each other through their minds. Uh, but it's just the 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 script is on screen yeah. and their their lips are moving. Um, basically, he's talking about how he has been visiting uh, Midia. What is it called? Midia? Midia. 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 Over and over from for... the Bible, Steve. From oh right, my, my favorite book. Yeah. Um, and uh, basically, he's been having the same dream over and over for long periods of time, and then he gets a phone call from Doctor Philip K. Dick. And uh, he he basically uh, is he's calling him in for for a checkup or whatever his therapist right, and uh, we're we're then told that uh, a pretty sus checkup it's worth saying oh yeah he's like sitting in the hey, dark. Uh, out of nowhere I would uh, like you to uh... I actually think also in the earlier cuts it fully reveals there that he's the killer like I think you see him lift up up the mask because yeah right. there is like I, I think both of the bits i watched it didn't have his weird long talk of masks and like showing his mask collection right he yeah in this sequence it's like he's sitting in the it's it's also very sus he's sitting in the dark <laughs> on the phone at like, night at night the yeah. middle of the night i need you to come in for a, a checkup tomorrow and uh he goes in and you know He's got a creepy office too for a therapist. It's not welcoming whatsoever. It's like a big giant open window with a stark background and gray walls and a weird uh, geometric statue in the center of the room. Um, but he reveals to him that a series of murders has occurred uh, in the homes and to the people in the exact ways that uh, Nightbreed himself has been describing in his hypnotherapy sessions. And he's got it all recorded. Which is like, you know, basically telegraphing to us immediately. Like, oh, the doctor is just murdering people. <laughs> it's it's like the least mm. twisty twist you'll ever see. Yeah, I, I mean, even the director's cut, I was shocked at how early that's revealed. Yeah. I, thought, I definitely thought he was lurking around in a mask a bit longer. But Well, as far as I know, I think that uh, it was never really supposed to be a big reveal 
either mm. way. It wasn't yeah, supposed to yeah. be hidden from us, right? And he seems uh, pretty sinister from the from the yeah. The, there, from there's the a, a lot of interesting. Like I again, I nobody really goes in depth into a lot of the studio fighting. Um, mm. But the fascinating thing seems to be that the studio was really jazzed on Cronenberg. And like a lot of the people complained that they just really wanted to be a slasher about him. So yeah. they reached out a bunch with him and then really jazzed on, I got to look up the guy's name, the guy who cuts his skin off. They also shot a ton with him, including, okay, based on all our cuts, he's dead. Based on this, the studio reshot that he's like, don't worry, I lived, brother. See you yeah. next adventure. <laughs> and he winks, <laughs> even though he's a severed head or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I can't so, kill me by a decapitation. So that's like fascinating because yeah, they they like <laughs> just brought that guy back. So it's like it's an interesting studio fight where like actually the studio just like liked different stuff in the movie than I think the intention of the movie. I had yeah. a weird thing where I didn't know that Boone becomes Cabal. Oh. And for some reason in my head, I was like, oh, the guy with the with the cabal mobile later. That's what I called that car that they're driving around. Yeah, might as well. Um, I I was like, that must be him because he seems like a fun part of this movie that he he doesn't seem to have enough scenes. So when he finally pulls that face off. Yeah. (laughs) You bastard. (laughs) But it makes so much sense that later in the movie, you know, they're in the they're they're at Baphomet and and he's Mm. like, You're the chosen one, Neo. To, to Boone, and he's, you know, he's the daywalker guy. Uh, then I was like, oh, that makes perfect sense. But for the longest time, I'm watching this thing going, yeah, this movie needs more of that character, I think, because he's kind of funny. He's like the, <laughs> yeah. the, the taxi cab driver yeah. in uh, in the Escape movies, in the Escape from New York movie. Yeah. Yeah, you are the studio. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's like the interesting thing, I, I put it in the chat, but like, they're not wrong, because I do think that like, the filmmaking in those Cronenberg killer scenes are amazing. And that look is amazing. And that guy, like, I know I, I kind of have the weird thing of like, what is your accent? But uh, <laughs> he does pop. Like, he, yeah, he works in a lot of ways. Because there's a lot of, like, real rough kind of 90s quips in this yeah. movie for some yeah. reason. Uh, and and he takes on a brunt of those. But he pulls it off. Speaking yeah. of uh, the 90s, speaking of Midian, um, I want to mention that there was a professional wrestler named Midian mm. who looked like this, okay? Um, they repackaged him, speaking of studio interjection, and he became naked Midian, and then he looked like this. So, oh. It looks like he has a fanny pack on covering yeah. his... Uh... Well, you can't be fully Jane. nude on TV, obviously, yeah. so... Oh, so he was uh, naked, okay. Yeah. He, was a he, they gave back. him a streaker gimmick and he quit wrestling forever and became a, a chef. So I, I thought you were going to be like, about... he became Cronenberg. Like, yeah. he should just have that mask. <laughs> like, wrestlers steal that mask. Yeah. yeah he's I, actually think, just... I think it's niche enough. And I also think <laughs> help. It seems like Nightbreed fans are just like, it's like being a Canadian watching a movie shot in Toronto where you just be like, Nightbreed, yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah, brother. You're my well, favorite. Ask- guy. I was going to ask you about that, Cam, since this whole movie seems to take place in oh Edmonton Cal- and Calgary yeah. or in between. You're, you're from Actually, Alberta. Actually, north of is the weird part. It, it's kind of like northeastern Alberta is where Midian's supposed to be. But yeah, so it starts in Calgary. There's weird parts in Edmonton, which their version of is very much uh, <laughs> the side of a highway. Uh, <laughs> so that's a little embarrassing, my hometown. Uh, but yeah, I've been obsessed with it forever and I still don't get it. And I tried to look again to be like, cause Cabal the book is set in Calgary. So I, I do know there's like a few statements where, uh, Clive Barker likes to write stuff in America because he likes to kind of be like divorced from the mythology of like where he's from. Cause he's British. Um, he also, yeah, he likes to kind of choose places that are out of the ordinary and unusual. And I've always taken it, there's a weird Rudyard Kipling quote because of the um, natural gas deposits in southern Alberta where he says that, like, <laughs> they have hell for a basement. You might know for the horrible Nickelback song, <laughs> also called hell for a basement. Uh, yeah. But, um, yeah, I have no idea why it's set in Calgary, and I think it's baffling and interesting. And they did obviously shoot some stuff in Alberta. It's kind of the wrong 
part of Alberta because it should be pretty like prairies where Midian is. I uh, thought that yeah. Clive Barker was Canadian, even though I was like, he's British, right? And yeah. then I was like, what is happening in this movie? And this I, movie's I, mostly shot in England at Pinewood. So <laughs> it's also like that's partially why some of that those sets look bizarre and every house do, looks British. They do that weird uh wide shot of I think it's Calgary with hmm. the power they have that yeah, smaller yes, power yeah, yeah. which uh if you've been watching this show for a while uh we talk about that tower because it's in stay tuned weirdly mm, because they oh, just shot a bunch in in i think that movie was shot in calgary but they're like it's fucking chicago yeah. because you know what i mean uh I, but i couldn't get over through this movie every time they just dropped those names yeah and, I'll, and I'll like, like really it's off-putting oh and there's actually like it drives people kind of nuts because the directions to Midian are like 75 percent real places in alberta directions <laughs> and then it throws out two cities dwyer and something else that don't exist but there's like i think that there's a boing boing post where a guy's like well okay i, I believe i found the location of midian alberta and he's like is it? I, like I, not as if but he's like this is where i think it would be set right. uh, and, and it's, it actually does seem like clive barker chose a place on a map that is like mostly you know reservations and kind of no roads and stuff which is mm -hmm. kind of a fun idea but yeah, that like Peace River is real. He says like uh, north of somewhere, east of Peace River, like all those places are real. So it's yeah. it's super, yeah, super bizarre and fascinating. And it's, almost like you say the opposite, where it's like they are not hanging a lantern whatsoever mm -hmm. on the fact that this is. But like it's just you hear Calgary, you hear Edmonton, you're like huh? that's the weird huh? part. Of and it, even like it. the police are they're kind of RCMP, kind of not. Okay. Uh, but you can easily do some like, accents. Like people are kind of trying to do not an American accent. I would say but... you could easily do the Midwest, uh, United States, mm. but it's it's so much smaller and so much closer together that I putting mean, it in this area, it's very, it's very possible he just wanted something different, right? Like yeah, oh, I think to... that might just be it because there's. Never but I mean, been, geographically, yeah. like it's so wide open that you could hide a monster town. Oh, for in a sure. graveyard yeah. out in the middle of nowhere yes. in fucking you know rural yeah. Canada. A lot Maybe he just than... threw a dart at a map of North America and was like, <laughs> "All right, no, for this sure. is where Midian goes." And <laughs> I mean, he was also like the, the other weird thing is, yeah, he like his career really blew up. So like maybe he was doing it, like Calgary's a big enough city to think he might have gone to some sort of Comic Con right, or something yeah. and just been there and been Inspired. you know, hey, this is pretty every town. But yeah, it's it's yeah. bizarre that it doesn't use like you know she sings at a club. Why isn't it like a country? club you know like it would be a country sure, bar yeah. and that's like not even offensive that's just like if you were the most famous singer in calgary you'd be in a 1980 whatever definitely yeah. be a country bar. Be there, yeah but it's like a jazzy kind of jazz bar yeah it's like just like an la club kind of which is like all right and uh, yeah all of it kind of works like the weird art deco kind of uh, office cronenberg has works and yeah and the like i say the cop that's like not quite rcmp but kind of is it uh, still works <laughs> it's yeah. just and like unfortunately like oh having a weird rural militia yeah we do have those too <laughs> like yeah. we, we absolutely have today. the militia yeah. that's just waiting for like wait a town of monsters oh my god we've been waiting forever <laughs> finally i can use my shotgun <laughs> though i will say uh i think he goes even harder than old guillermo del toro on like <laughs> the monster is man <laughs> yeah i do think that even if we found a city of real freaks who are like Please don't hurt me. We probably just wouldn't. He's like, all right, they're come right. in blasting. Yeah. <laughs> ask questions later. They're freaks. Yeah. Oh, there's children. Better blast them first. <laughs> yeah. I was wondering about that scene um, in this opening, but we do get the towards the end of the epilogue. That's what it says in the notes. I don't. Mm. I'm not going. But when <laughs> when De no it's when Decker prologue, maybe absolutely. Uh, that's what I meant to say. Uh, prologue. Uh, but anyway, when Decker's going through the house in his uh, in his Slipknot, I call, I Damn. referred to him as Slipknot in my no, notes for, for the sure. rest of it. Uh, when he's killing that family, does that scene just go on and on and on of him skulking around the house, no. or is it just still pretty like it's it's contained? There's a little bit more of the beginning of the the couple, the married couple, um, mm -hmm. kind of like interacting flirtatiously. It's so jarring in the in the extended ultimate cabal cut. It's like this horrible, horrible VHS uh, rip where it's like, <laughs> you're like, I thought it was a shot of a TV. I'm like, what is this home video? And then it like cuts to <laughs> this is before I got far into it, where I realized there's going to be a lot more of that. Um, but it's it's yeah, it's just a little bit of uh, extended flirtation between the husband and wife, which I don't think 
you know necessarily hurt the scene i think it's just like didn't need to be in there but it did give you an idea that's a, a loving family you know yeah and this is to point out that slipknot which i think would be a great villain name i wrote him I down mean, as henry selick it's he also like character. <laughs> it's also insane that like because i don't know any other movie we would get a lot more of what the serial killer is the hunt for the serial killer and whatever but it's instead it's like you just have to take for granted they've been hunting the serial killer for a while and he's killed yeah. a lot of people and you don't see it but it's like we never hear what that killer's name is no. he doesn't have any name other than dr decker because yeah. like we just see him in the freaky mask uh which is yeah, like a good like villain killer name but like they don't refer to the serial killer as no. his name because they don't know it's him but again he, i think that's the unfortunate the thing of like uh decker you know you you kind of get the impression that decker is going to be resurrected and be like an unkillable guy on the side of the other anti baphomet guy yeah like a and it's like yeah master. oh man in nightbreed 2 decker's not gonna pop up yeah. now the neck decker is the nightbreed <laughs> anything can happen yeah. spoiler for the ending i thought after he gets killed and falls into the chasm he was going to rise as some sort of ultimate oh, monster that would be great like, yeah. like a just Ko koopa situation <laughs> yeah exactly. i mean i i thought it was going to be a thing where like his his face becomes similar to the mask that he wears because sure. it's so up, right like it's it's a, just a representation of the monster inside him because he has a monster inside him right like it mm. is he talks to the mask like it's another person yeah. um i was wondering like all the characters have wild names and Decker is his name is Philip K. Decker, which is clearly a reference to Philip K. Dick, the character mm. Decker from Blade Runner. Um, but I was wondering if the other characters are references to anything, because that's usually something that amateur filmmakers do to be like, eh, <laughs> it's it's the Savini house or whatever, you know, I do know a couple people hit on a few things and uh, like, yeah, because, yeah, Narcisse was something he's based on because like the other thing that the one guy said is like Clive Barker is very funny because he'll he'll give you the most detailed character stuff but he's like it's yeah. stuff you can never look up so he said like we are your guys basically based on like uh, these eight movies and he's like the only movie I could even find was Death in Venice so he's like I just went all in on Death in Venice right. uh, and then the other funny one was Doug Bradley's character is Dirk Wilesberg and uh, he they ended up dubbing his voice and he's like, he thinks because it's called Lylesburg, the voice was dubbed with a German accent. And he's oh. like, I, I didn't play it with a German accent. And he's like, I think they only dubbed me because they like wouldn't pay to fly me out to ADR. Okay. Uh, but yeah, he's like, it's very funny that they chose to make this guy German. So whatever. But yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I, yeah, and some people have these full names. They're like Shuna Sassy. I do know that like the part of the Nightbreed concept that kind of doesn't get across, but kind of, you know, it's a messy concept. But it's that it's all kind of monsters from all folklore and mythology yeah, that that's have all, almost down. been stomped out. So I think some of them are meant to be representative of some folkloric creature. Because I think he's a bit of a Neil Gaiman guy, Clive Barker, who loves like all mythology and all whatever. Right. I think if, was it Neil Gaiman? Some other author appears in the bar scene. Uh, they oh, were well. saying in the documentary, but if you look at the crowd dancing to her singing, <laughs> I think it's Neil Gaiman, and she's like, "Yeah, that's a that's a hot subject right now." Uh, uh, he, 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 uh, I mean, he ooh, ooh. send him to Midian, where all can be forgiven. <laughs> am I right? Bob? Well, it's interesting too, because as the movie goes on, it's not like it, it's not like these people are inherently evil. No, it's actually kind of a holy land for an afterlife. Uh, it's like an explanation of an afterlife and it's not even like if you do bad things you become a monster you just like have like a monster in you and it can be brought oh, yeah. out if you're like the, vampire, I mean, like the vampire rules yeah <laughs> i mean that's uh there's a lot of the rules of the night breed but i also think this is again like trying to dig into like what clive barker was thinking i think he wrote this after weave world maybe one of his like incredibly elaborately built worlds and he's like i specifically wanted to just be like night like cabal is just vibes like like yeah. i don't want to over explain anything i don't want to and i do think that that's part of why people love this movie so much but it is part of also like yeah what do you like you do you have to kill like palaquin is kind of like you can't be in here man because you haven't done anything bad yet yeah he's like and, but then spoil. his bite kind of does it and then when you add again the ending now where he has to bite his girl like all it takes is a bite of a nightbreed to become a nightbreed and, you're like, and then also like Boone has like a shady past to yeah. 
It's like, I yeah. killed people, man. I killed 15 people. Yeah. Well, he, he he thinks he killed people, but it was the doctor that did it. But it was the yes. doctor. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, did he kill people? I don't know. But there's also a weird implication that he was a nightbreed before and got exiled. Yeah. Well, I mean, people. it's the weird thing where he is kind of nightbreed Moses. Right. You know, like he he was always meant to come where Palaquin's yeah. like, look at this mural. It was me. I didn't understand. Yeah. I was a mural. And, and also, like, why are you mad then? Yeah. <laughs> but then also the weird thing where, like, he is, uh, I guess he's the, like, resurrection of Jesus where he's, like, he's not the savior that they thought they would get because he's the one that's, like, tear down Midian. It's worthless. We need to fight. Yeah, but I but I think it's revered revealed at the end Baph by, by Baphomet that he it is it is actually, Baphomet winks yeah wink, but it, it is like the yeah, possibility Baphomet that he would wanted it, it but Baphomet just wouldn't tell the other people because right, he's an yeah. asshole I guess he wants right, he right. wanted Cabal to like rebuild Midian yeah though right. maybe does Baphomet not actually talk to anyone except Cabal that might be possible too I think that they're all around but I don't know if they can hear him they can hear not, yeah yeah I think because I think they're like he talked to Baphomet. Yeah, and only he. We were all there. We didn't hear anything. Mm -hmm. The first section of this movie, um, which we're still sort of in. Yeah, sorry. You know, we're no, it's all. fine. It, it's fine. I just, I just want to cover it, like, because we we touched on a little bit of this. There's the Lori character. Boone and Lori have a very good relationship, seemingly. Uh, yeah, it's yeah, hundred percent. Just like their relationship's good. Do not question it. Yeah, <laughs> like, and later she's like, I don't even know if I knew everything. you yeah. this whole time, anyway. Uh, she is concerned about his mental state, but it's pretty much all good. We see a bit of the the Decker manipulation with the the weird pills. He's like, "Take these pills for your oh. mental health. They'll be you'll be fine." He trips yeah. yeah. off yes. of them. Yeah, take and this. Then, uh, what do they say? Like psychiatric grade hallucinogen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then he People wanders out into yeah, he wanders out into traffic and doesn't somehow gets hit by a. Mac truck, but doesn't get vaporized because he's like, yeah, oh, wow. yeah. It's, it's a, it is a very weird one too, where it's like, dude, just take your fucking shrooms and hang out at your girlfriend's show. Yeah. What are you yeah. doing? I do think, I do also think that like the whole his whole setup is so like that, would that have ever worked? <laughs> like Decker doesn't seem like he's going to be able to stop killing. So why do you have a patsy? And then also, I mean, I guess he's using him as like Midian bait, but I also do at least forgive that like. I, I would see Lori being like, wait, he didn't kill 15 yeah. families. When? Like, We've been together I've been dating him for like a long time. <laughs> He's not sneaking. And even that night, like she she's his alibi that night. Yeah. Yeah. The night and he I'm kills such... people, they're in bed together. We see it. <laughs> I'm so <laughs> naive that I'm watching this two hour cut of this movie expecting you guys to fill in no pertinent mm -hmm. information but it sounds like the movie is the same movie just with more people just walking around <laughs> oh yeah i mean i was gonna say the the, the funniest part cut. in the the ultimate cabot ultimate cabot cut um <laughs> the, the the what the sex scene where they both leave their shirts on but yeah. take their underwear off like pretty explicit i will say that the, at least the bits i saw of the ultimate cut a little more homoerotic a, yeah. a lot more Craig Schaefer, but, you but, see so uh, much but yeah, yeah, the, like the, it's just a weird thing where it's like it, it is kind of explicit for two people to take off their underwear, just their underwear and then yeah. straddle each other, but it's also funnily not that explicit because they both have shirts on. Yeah, uh, it's but a yeah, no bottoms party. It, it, they, they were truly, at least in the bit I saw, was not more explanation. It was, no, it, it's yeah. there's like a sequence that I don't think is in the the. Um, the director's cut, but it might be uh, where he, he pours out all the letters and, and photographs and passport of himself and burns it all before yeah. he trips out on drugs. And I, I, I guess it's just supposed to be like him burning either his past or his present self, like burning his identity, but he's also already tripping out on goofballs or whatever the doctor gave him. Yeah. Um, but while he's burning it, he has a vision of himself and her making love where he's just like watching them make love to, creepy weird uh danny well elfa elaborate music. danny alpha music plays yeah, yeah i mean that's the other weird thing note. that does make this movie kind of slap is like yeah constant danny elfman and and honestly all the bits <laughs> in the director's gut and even the ultimate was pretty good at just they're like listen if, if we got a rough piece we're just gonna put some <laughs> you know booty I was saying this, elfman underneath yeah, i was saying to steve that music. The, the score sounds like if danny elfman was like you know 
so this is a year after Batman, mm-hmm. but like a year before Beetlejuice, or is yeah. Beetlejuice before? And the- probably uh, no, Beetlejuice is before Batman, but this right, is probably yeah, yeah. done before Batman hits, if that makes sense. But the the score sounds like if you mix Batman and Beetlejuice together. Yeah, I also find it interesting because like Elfman nowadays is very capable of a chill score, but yeah, this yeah. is kind of like the Beetlejuice Batman style, but chill. Like like it's yeah. doing the yeah. but like <laughs> but like pretty dramatic. <laughs> yeah. Not yeah, not uh you know, not the tales from the crypt, but uh, yeah. close. It's a lot of oboes and a lot of chanting, uh, yes. and a lot of deep bass. Um but another bad man, all these guys, everybody related to my brain is being taken down. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> they are the night bread. Uh, yeah, I mean, I and... guess people were hiring him for this at that point, right? They're like, oh, we want Yeah, you to do this is still pretty and... early, but it's yeah. like, yeah, good enough. And I would say, especially post the few Tim Burtons, it's like, yeah, it's what you want. Yeah. Give me what you did in the Army of Darkness, please. Mm-hmm. Uh, I will say, um, speaking of Nightbread. <laughs> That's when they said the name of the movie in the movie. Constant. <laughs> constantly the enough. first time the first time it is done is at 25 minutes and 15 seconds okay. but once you hear it that first time they are they refer to the night breed probably five seven more times <laughs> yeah this movie. yeah this is not one where they shy away from that no it's like we watched barbie a couple weeks ago mm. and i did a title drop oh my four, god four minutes into the show and we yeah. were like well they say it that's her name and i was like that's kind of what the point i'm making yeah. Uh, it's it's the name of the movie is kind of the conceit of the movie. Mm. So. Yeah, I mean, you could probably get away without saying Nightbreed in this movie because it's just sort of a concept more yeah. than anything else, right? And yeah. also, you know, when in that background, there look exactly like Ivan Ooze from Yeah, the Rangers. That's I just true. Pelican <laughs> is giving <laughs> real <laughs> Ivan Ooze. Somebody, somebody, check if they just reuse that mold for Ivan. <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. that sounds like something Heim Saban would get. <laughs> <laughs> he just got all the fucking all the old masks and was like those are you know what yeah, you know yeah. what we're doing yeah number so one night fan <laughs> yeah, yeah. hey seasons, you know who the pirate uh, super Rangers can fire? uh every single guy from that <laughs> yes, yeah. moon face we got a bunch all of dusty nightbreed masks over here uh, <laughs> i think there is a moon face monster i'm sure the there is there's gotta be yeah <laughs> I assume there was like a really like sort of interesting, creepy illustration of that guy before he was made into the weirdest mask ever. <laughs> yeah, I, it's true. I do uh, actually they showed the only illustration that was in the doc was of Shuna Sassy. And she's pretty close to what she is, except the face is like a little freakier. But you're right. like, oh, yeah, he did a pretty good. But I, yeah, I'm curious because <laughs> like Clive Barker is not 100% an artist. Uh, so it was kind of interesting to see his concept sketches. And I do wonder, yeah, what is a limitation, what isn't? Because I think that that's pretty... Uh, actually, in the, the Hellraiser Jihad comic, they showed the new Cenobite they came up with, and he has an arrow sticking out of his head and has a ponytail coming out of his forehead. <laughs> and it was just Your like... Their face is on upside down. Wow, well, yeah, it was funny. <laughs> but eventually, he pisses off. Pinhead, because he's like, you're a terrible Cenobite. And everyone's like, yay! Anyway, it was a, it was a very funny review. I really appreciated uh, roasting so that like, shitty Cenobite. Are the night... Is this like a prequel story for the Cenobites? Like, uh, I... So, apparently in, in these comics, so like, I, I do... You do forget that the Cenobites worship another biblical god, mm-hmm. Leviathan. So, essentially, oh, it's okay. like Baphomet versus Leviathan. And these are the followers. And I can't remember why, but Pinhead is disgusted by the Nightbreed because of their chaotic nature or something. So he's like, I must exterminate Nightbreed. But yeah, it's like they're, they are both the followers of a, a god that God did away with in the Bible. Well, that, that, that's funny because if it, it, I always bring up Final Fantasy. That's like mm. a stupid thing that I do on the sure. show. And I mean, Levi- I, Final Fantasy has all those guys. Well, Leviathan is a summon, and Baphomet is mentioned in mm. lots of biblical references. But this Midian feels like in Final Fantasy VI, there's this place called Land of the Espers, and these Espers are basically like kind of god people, like they're just these like monsters that sort of get invaded by the like Hitler of that universe, mm. and he starts stealing them to use them as magic. 
And I almost thought that's where this movie was going a little bit because it's like once they infiltrate this world, it's like what when, when the humans siege this literal world, if they take one of these monsters and crush it into a diamond, which is what the espers are in Final Fantasy VI, could you use them as magic? And I'm sitting there going like, this is literally the land of the espers. And I saw mm. so many, so many parallels that like is this like a, a common theme in the bible i've never really read the bible but is there this like land of... uh, yeah i mean i think i think i was hearing that midian in the bible is kind of a place between life and death and it's like a city that's destroyed oh there we go real feels podcast has me on the uh, <laughs> <laughs> terrible sounding nightbreed comics but uh yeah i i mean i uh, yeah i i don't remember i did look it up a bit but yeah it's it's a city that's destroyed in the bible i believe but yeah i it is you know and it does seem like i mean i, I again to go back to director stuff i kind of feel like this is trying to do stuff that Guillermo del Toro would like more successfully do later. Uh, yeah. And like what you're saying actually is like what feels maybe a little missing from this narrative. Cause this one is just that humans want to destroy the night breed. What feels like is missing is humans want to exploit the night breed. Yeah. Which they see pull... Slightly in the sexual stuff, but otherwise they just want to shoot them. Like if you could pull out, if you could pull somebody from this world, would that introduce real magic to the real world? If, yeah. because, you know, Cabal is like very Neo, very, uh -huh. you know, like very like the chosen one feeling. Yeah, the old uh, hero's journey. Exactly. No, he's like drawn via dreams. And so, so I don't know, it's a little outside of it. But that uh, it's, it, there's a lot. Um, I think that's another reason why this movie is so compelling. Like, you know, when I first saw it, I, I was very much into the monster idea of it where I'm like, oh, cool. I like all of the monster makeup here. But the more you get into it, the more that hero's journey stuff makes it more intriguing. But like you were saying earlier, Cam, where all of these characters are cool enough that they could have their own side stories. You know, mm -hmm. there's dangling mm -hmm. threads everywhere. And even the end of the movie where where we want Cronenberg to be cronenberg and come out of the ground as a Cronenberg <laughs> monster. Uh, I can he understand out of his own chest somehow. Yeah, I can understand the love that exists for it, even though it's not particularly a great movie. It's just still so. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, I think that that's that is the strength that Clive Barker had as a filmmaker. And like you said before, world building, it, it's yeah. always been his thing. And uh, yeah, he, I, it's just. A t and it's tough to know like if the monsters looked a bit cooler that's actually not the problem because <laughs> no, no. it's just like it's more that these plots are all kind of touched on and dropped and uh, yeah, i think that and, they yeah. didn't spend enough time explaining the berserkers because the berserkers oh. fascinated me so much let me <laughs> tell you they're uncontrollable it. <laughs> the, it, it was a bit i liked hearing about the bad so so the comics were weird i guess because they were they claim to have been conceptualized, but everyone kind of disputes that the 90s... So these comics came out at pretty much the same time. Uh, everyone disputes that uh, it's like different artists every time and different writers quite often. So they kind of just felt all over the place. But the one that sounds very interesting is about like the creation of the Berserkers uh, and that they were crea like they were essentially like a weird thing where <laughs> during World War One briefly the nightbreed teamed up with the kaiser and is oh. like we'll help you but they created these berserkers and kind of regretted it and is like oh this is what happens when we work with humans and like this is why we have to kind of be totally away because like our powers combined with humans is too fucked up and i think that they like sacrifice nightbreed to create the berserkers so it's like that comic sounds cool i do want to read that right. yeah, like i will buy good. this bad co collection to read that one comic no one even story. if the art looks like <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah but some of the art looks like behind me is actually comic art which is like yeah there's like a weird monster that that is like i'm so old i have no more teeth but he just fills his mouth with, with knives, knives and <laughs> scissors and stuff scissors like, and a razor blade i didn't That's realize awesome. that yeah, it's, I didn't realize yeah. that was a mouth until yeah, I thought it was like, back. <laughs> it's, I think it's like the final frame. He's like, lucky yeah. I got my dentures. <laughs> and you're like, yeah. Thanks, I think it's the same the uh, weird comic group that did. I think, Jason, you've talked to me about this. The Those weird kind of adult Ghostbusters comics from the late 80s and early 90s. I think it's that same sort of failed. <laughs> yeah, well, there was also me and Steve have talked about how there's all these weird. There's that comic book company that made that uh, Ash versus. Oh uh, uh, yeah, that's Boom, maybe. 
Yeah, I I have you 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 anymore. showed it to me, and then I went and looked at their catalog, and it has all these like IPs. They got the the rights for all these crazy IPs, mm. and it has like Ash versus predator it's like some shit like that and what you're describing where they go back and meet the kaiser and they're in the civil war and all that mm. like that sounds like nightbreed sounds like a whole long line of comics in this uh done dynamite by, entertainment dynamite okay. entertainment yeah oh so yeah this, Freddy this versus was, jason versus ash i think yeah. epic comics is the one uh that did nightbreed but they did a lot of those 80s alien comics and yeah. I, I do seem to remember that people actually did enjoy the Hellraiser comics of that era. I did, yeah. I I mean... Because you I'm, can actually do comics, the thing that they're talking about in Hellraiser in a comic book, not in a movie. It's true. Yeah. I guess. A lot, oh, oh I don't know. know. Then you there's gotta go more, to the, talk to the guy and he takes you in the bank and <laughs> you, like, there's, comics there's also a lot more like, creative, uh, creative leeway where you can just sort of like... I'm going to take these two characters and, and mash them together and see if anyone gives a shit when I try and bump Yeah, them. and I mean, what does, again, sound compelling sometimes of these comics is like following an individual Nightbreed member yeah. in another city or something. And Which just is why, like... I think a little bit why it would work as uh, a series, right? You could. Just, oh, yeah. You know, you well, I, I mean, to go to, back to maybe the b larger thing of just the plot, and like where we were in the plot, I think they just don't like as long as much as this movie is too long. It also like doesn't spend enough time on anything. Yeah, yeah I where, was like the uh, the scene where we meet Sissus for the first time that could have been twenty five minutes of expository information, getting to know the character before he cuts his face off. But it's like even the ultimate edition, there's only about forty five seconds uh, in the middle there where we get a little bit more. Yeah, and isn't that like? Like you could have a whole episode where this guy's locked in a ho a hospital room where yeah. he thought he was going to die and he didn't, and beside him is this crazy guy and he's the only person who's ever mentioned the place this guy dreams, dreams of yeah. that drives him nuts. But this guy seems extra nuts, and you're like, well, do I trust <laughs> the crazy guy, <laughs> the yeah. super crazy guy, or do I trust my doctor who seemingly set me up? That could mm -hmm. be a whole TV episode. Yeah, there's a, a lot of that stuff. Uh, but I also just think like. Like Jason, the cut you and I watched, the director's one, like before it's even one hour in, we are fully mask off revealed yeah. that Brandon Burke's a bad guy. Yes. Lori is already deeply in Midian. And they're like, okay, like it's it's not about the girl finding Midian, like she's in it. And I've then talked about like, this before. Ugh. I have this thing with movies where the first like 15 minutes of any movie I watch for the first time, I'm going to like. I'm not going to remember it because it's just sort of throwing all this new information. And the second time I watch it, I'll hone in. In that first 20 minutes, we get like, we, we're we introduced to Boone. We're introduced to Decker. We're introduced to their relationship. We're introduced to Midian. We're introduced to a monster. We're introduced to the, the drugs. We're introduced to Lori. We're introduced to Lori's fucking nightclub shit. And then we're introduced to him getting hit by a, bus yeah. and then like 10 minutes after Man, that introduced to a bus <laughs> yeah <laughs> and then 10 minutes after that he's dead i'll just talk about the second like segment of the movie oh yeah it, the i mean the second segment is maybe the weakest in this regard of like does any of this need to happen the boon finds midian it's a cemetery oh. he encounters the mysterious residents he meets <laughs> peloquin boon drives uh... for uh like 20 hours straight <laughs> <Yeah. day. laughs> that is yeah driving from calgary to four hours north of edmonton they're we close but they're that... not that close <laughs> we get that reveal that decker is a serial killer he he then manipulates the police into you know at them believing Boone is the killer just because he's like mysteriously on the run from mm. you know and then Boone gets killed by the police and Decker and he you know that and that has all happened in 40 minutes yeah like all all that laundry list of things which that's like a movie <laughs> oh absolutely and, and I do think like one of the great weaknesses, and I don't think it's even explained yet at this point, is Decker's motivation. Is just like I, I mean, hate it's never things really that breed. Yeah. <laughs> he hates humans that breed, and Nightbreed is the like if the Nightbreed was constantly fucking yeah, and breeding, having <laughs> babies, I get it. And there are a lot of children. There's a few like, children, but like. Uh, I don't know. It's it's terrible, and it's not explained. I think until way later, when like Decker's mask off to Lori, maybe. 
Yeah. And it's just like, what is, yeah, it's so weird. And so I think that that's the weird thing is like what we're used to in a traditional 3X structure. And I will say that this structure issue exists even in the, the, the tightest theatrical cut. This is not that's, a extension issue. That's like, true. Yeah. That's, that's my nativity, uh, nativity and whatever. And also like, I'm, I'm sitting there going like, they're explaining so many things to me in such a short period of time for how basic the story really is. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a really simple story about a guy who is, you know, the chosen one for this group of like mythical beings. Mm -hmm. And there's a guy who hates the mythical beings. It's really yeah. hero villain, magical land magic it, it really feels like a, a lot like an old 80s fantasy film mm. like a crawl yeah, yeah, or yeah. like a labyrinth but then for some reason they're just throwing new ideas that that one character comes and goes so fast that, that the woman that laurie meets on the road oh yeah who is great and, and then she, she gets is. killed like immediately <laughs> Yes. But she comes and goes so fast that when they introduce that next girl who just works at like a yeah, she's like eating the fucking croissant and you're the like, floor. yeah, yes, I'm like yes. no, they look the same. And I was like, I know I just saw her get fucking. Uh, yeah, I love that scene, but that scene drink. also makes no damn sense. <laughs> and he also puts down the previous woman's head on the fucking table, it's right? The, I think it's the guy. So I think what he does is prop up a man's body, chop his head off put his head because she's like oh jim and then when he gets <laughs> up, it's his head but the thing yeah. is cronenberg's behind her so i also think what we just don't see that his headless body is also like leaning on the table but yeah again this is just stuff that is yeah and it's very interesting because it's not like huh, it's tough to say what like what to cut and it's tough mm -hmm. to say like you could not like when we're saying oh the scope is too large too yeah, you couldn't cram this into one movie because, like, do you guys you, ever uh, I don't ask know. yourself, like, what is horror? I find oh, myself yeah. asking that question to myself very. I, I do also think that that is actually like part of this this Barker Studio fight. Is and I've this learned is like dark fantasy. Yeah, exactly. And I've learned over the years, especially doing this show, that horror movies aren't necessarily scary and mm. usually they're not scary there's just like tropes and you fit a bunch of those tropes together and then it becomes a horror but then like you just you literally just said this i don't think this really is a horror movie i think it is a dark fantasy because it very much leans on fantasy tropes more mm. than it does horror but then it's still in that era of practical effects yeah. And all the practical effects look so fucking hyper realistic that mm. like all of the all of the horror elements of this movie are really oh great yeah and, and there's and too, there's too many bits that are like too fucked up like and again truly the the bit where he's killing the family is brutal and it it's ends with him to me. slowly approaching a child and a tear running down the child's face because yes. he knows he's going to die yeah. like that is. That's wild and, and hyper R-rated. But yeah, then the rest of it, you're like, oh, and then yeah, the, the behemoths are like an interesting story, but they're kind of putties by the end of they it. They are kind know? of putties. They're you can like, subtract yeah. a couple of things from this movie and it'll be a fun PG-13 dark fantasy. Absolutely. Movie. And actually, I was going to say that the guy with his face cut off reminds me a lot of Little Monsters. The, exactly. The, yeah, the blue the guy alternate, from Little the face, Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, which is terrifying. And again, that's like screwed up the other way where it's like, oops, we accidentally had one R-rated scene in the middle of a PG film. <laughs> uh, and yeah, no, it's very fascinating but it is like i do think i, I maybe i'm repeating myself but i think watching these cuts made me be like ah it kind of sucks to just realize that there maybe wasn't they maybe never shot anything that would fully make sense yeah and there wasn't a full vision to turn a book into a movie as yeah as yeah and, and it's just like maybe you know this this movie really is what it is and i do think that there's a lot of appeal to it but uh, yeah, yeah, it's just too bad that, I, like, as a kid, you're like, oh, something's wrong, I can imagine. And, and these movies exist. Like, I mean, uh, I always think of Possession, the, the, the Zhilovsky movie. Like, the cut that was presented to the American public 
like you can't even find it's kind of the same but where that now has become legendary because they're just like adding voiceover being like hello this is satan this is a movie about a monster <laughs> and, and, and now it's like a respected art film and it's like oh oh my god but uh yeah there's not really that here it's just like yeah one kind of mess or another kind of mess feels very good it feels very like ninja turtles too but you yeah. just take the you take all the colors oh, yeah. and have some blood and it's you got a lot of different little weird monsters from a Saturday morning cartoon. Like I'm go, I'm watching this thing going. I didn't look this up. I forgot to look it up. Oh sure. But are there action figures for this movie? Oh, I'm because sure there are somewhere, right? If this not... is a toy, and I don't mean like you know uh, McFarland toys made. Oh, I was gonna say somebody get Todd McFarland on the board. Yeah. <laughs> no, not not of the time. I don't think. That's but I like, want to yeah. push. On the legs of the guy with the cool, like, ghosty face when his little tentacles come out of his gut, like, and yeah. pushing on his legs. That's what that reminded me of. Uh, there's a there's an action figure from um, uh, from Beetlejuice uh, of Obnoxious, which is that character that is like the friend of uh, Catherine O'Hara, you know, and he's like, oh, he's like yeah. sure. and you take off his. He, he take off his little head and he's got a scared face underneath. Yeah. It's very Ghostbusters adjacent as well. And a lot of these monsters reminded me of like that. Like you push the legs up on uh, the, 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 the spiky woman and her spikes come out, you know, like you, Peliquin, same, same feature. We have, yeah. just, you know, cost cutting measures. Um, uh, I will say there's a really banging NECA that does the really fancy figures lately. Okay. Has a, has a yeah. very good uh, Decker figure. Uh, cool. So if you love the Decker design, yeah, it looks re- Which real I, nice. Oh yeah, it, famously it has. has... Same, I guess this image that I have behind me is like the box art for the toy. Oh mm. cool, yeah. Neca is famous for its like uh, hyper realistic looking like Batman and Joker from the Dark Knight. And I mean, obviously, you guys know uh, ne- the Neca site just like broke the internet because they released uh, Murder She Wrote, and it was well, their, <laughs> their fastest selling <laughs> toy of all time. Ryan uh, Angela Lansbury. <laughs> I know, but I, I love it. I'm like, I'm like, that's, a, that's actually a great idea. Like, uh, yeah. do Meg MPI and you will also. Oh, there, buy there's, a, there's a specific type of person that would never buy an action figure who would buy an Angela Oh, Lansbury. absolutely. I, yeah, that's also like, yeah, playing into the to the gay man. And yeah, I do. You're right. I assume he comes with a typewriter. <laughs> I, I don't <laughs> even remember. Problem. It looks good, though. It was fun because <laughs> it was like, it wasn't purely hyper realistic. There was a bit of a cartoon touch. Right, right. That's cool. Um, I still think that he looks more like a Selleck character than he does a Slipknot character. Oh, yeah, I mean, I see it. I, I love the fact that the mouth is so weird. Like it's, the, the zip is not on the front. It like well, yeah. it all. Yeah, it almost looks like everything is being pulled to one side, which mm-hmm. is a really cool. Tra- it's it, it does sort of look like a Tim Burton. Yeah. Style. Well, I mean, yeah. It's like obviously it's like a sculpted, not not a bag. Which yeah. Is, yeah. It would that's be- where that's where I was thinking about the the Slipknot masks because they're mm. all very hyper stylized and look like different weird things. That's uh, that's man. There's like so many good things in this film, but then so many weird yeah. things. And and the the fact that the I, I'm gonna say this more times, so put a counter <laughs> on the screen. But like the fact that the three and a half hour cut doesn't add more context just adds it more adds people. a bit of context you didn't watch yeah. it it does i'm not <laughs> okay. saying it doesn't i'm just saying i'm fascinated that... to know in my life be- before i die jason let me know if you ever watched the three arc because <laughs> i think it'll I, tickle in your mind like it there, did me there are moments that are added that add a little bit of depth to the characters that is lacking in the director's okay. cut there's a yeah. moment there's a moment in the office at the very beginning where uh he has a, a breakdown to the doctor and the doctor is very compassionate and loving almost to him in a, in a way that a father would to a son. If, if someone was breaking down that doesn't exist in the other cut that adds a little bit of context to both characters and the trust that they have for one another that mm. seemingly doesn't exist, exist otherwise outside of that. Yeah. Also- get, well, we get the weird, there's no, uh, there's so little context for his mental illness before at all. Yeah. The doctor yeah. treated him for, and even the amount he told him about Midian and how much he knew about Midian. Because, like, obviously he knew enough to be like, 
and there's monsters and they're breeding and they're really stuck at in night yeah, yeah. night breeding they might uh, say okay yeah. breeding yeah. like i've yeah. killed all the people in calgary i guess i gotta, <laughs> I'll, uh, I gotta <laughs> move on to the underworld six, yeah. Six, yeah like i again in 10 months you can make a whole movie to me about a serial killer who gets so bored of serial killing people that he's like wait a minute there's monsters uh that's hello. dexter i guess yeah but you know a murder but killing. dexter doesn't kill vampires that's this is true. what i mean <laughs> like he's like i you know i'm tired of killing people it's so easy uh i need to find something sicker uh there's also a little bit more context in the scene between sisis and uh cabal in the hospital before he cuts his face off um you really get the idea in this clipped footage it's, it's also one of the nice things about the extended edition is it's very obvious when it's happening because <laughs> the audio mm. all of a sudden you can hear the ambient sound of the room like so horribly and like the quality goes down a little bit so you're like oh they added this but uh there's a there's an extended sequence of him getting down on his knees and essentially like praying to um to, to nightbreed just being like Oh, you're the you're the chosen one. You're you're gonna lead me to to Midian, and you you almost feel him as a god before he's even reached there as like the Messiah. He, he's yeah. he's recognized as the Messiah beforehand, and it gives a little bit more context to Sisis as well in what he was before he reaches his monster potential. I guess he is yeah. probably the least logical in terms of like oh like, you find out he was a monster. Uh, yeah, I also do feel like that's a fascinating one where. I'm like, some of this is maybe the reshoot, some of it isn't. And mm -hmm. also, I it's hard to tell how much Bar Clive Barker was in or not in on the reshoots. Right. Because yeah. that's like, yeah, the fact that he is like, they won't take me. Like, it'd be interesting if he's the guy who's never sure. But yeah. then by the time Laurie's coming, he's like, listen, it's old hat. I know all these guys. I, I know like, everything now. Yeah, follow me around. It's no problem. It's kind and of. And he's like cracking yeah. jokes about, like, I, I love a sailor. <laughs> That stuff, uh, which I love. Moonhead, me and Moonhead go way. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, he just said the guy, what guy? Nice tattoos. I love a sailor. I, I like, <laughs> yeah. I like that bit. But uh, yeah, it's that. That you're right. That part just doesn't. It's like two different movies. Yeah, uh, you 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 want the context, but at the same time, at a three and a yeah. half hour long version, if they were to add that context in, it's like, okay, well, fuck, we don't have time for it. And he's not even a main character, and doesn't really become one. He's he's literally sis is the chauffeur after a while <laughs> yeah he's like the around. comic relief yeah. character in a, yeah. non, in a movie that's not a comedy at all <laughs> but i mean his <laughs> bits are good like the the tattoo bit is good i like the yeah tattoos visual, bit. the visual comedy he, he does seem together. to be not affected by light so he yes. gets to do a little more which again yeah, yeah. some of them like explode they play, in the light yeah they play some fast them turn with that day walker stuff being a little freak in the light some of them <laughs> Yeah, yeah, turns into a, a giant chihuahua when you go in the light. I will say the, the most fascinating part of that documentary, and you're like, yeah, no, actually, I believe you, lady. She she's kind of going into actor talk, the main actress, but she's like, my job now is like working heavily with animals and like caring for animals, and that whole part where she saves the weird little freak animal and it turns into a little girl was cut in theatrical. So like, yeah. she's like, I hadn't seen that in 20 years. And yet I've spent 15 years of my life like obsessed with animals and rescuing animals. And she's like, like that was the moment. Well, she, no, she's watch. like, I that that seeing that moment literally like drove me insane because I was like, my first animal rescue was me acting through this weird thing of being like, hey, do you need water? Do you need whatever? And she's like, Yeah, maybe I did realize that I wanted to be an animal rescue person <laughs> with this cool. friggin' because she's like, it was very hard. Obviously, you're carrying a weird animatronic puppet. Yeah. And you're just trying to ignore the sound of servo motors and a hundred guys beside you, be like drinking their tea and being yeah. like, they take the one the teardrop. Weird, yeah, they take the Chihuahua one and give you the yeah. half Chihuahua, half yeah. human, and they give you the real human with this. Yes. And she's both like, I was both amazed that I was able to keep that performance, remembering how stupid it was, and then also being like, yeah, no, nope, unfortunately, this broke my mind for the rest of my life, and now all I do is rescue dogs. It is odd that that's not in the theatrical because I think for me that's probably one of the it's most makes the most sense. Moments. Oh yeah, yeah. and, it and I, you... that mother daughter is great throughout, yeah, and it fun. makes Lori you get like both why they would respect her because that mom keeps coming up in the director's yes. cut and helping her, 
And then also like, yeah, that, that a person, yeah. I mean, that's the other problem where it's just like that 99% of humanity, except for Lori and the black cop <laughs> are like, let's blow these fuckers apart. Oh, and I guess the priest, but everybody else. The priest is, like, is, is in it for different reasons. He wants to be a night breed and he becomes one. Yeah, I mean, the priest has lost his mind. Jason, yeah. do you want to take us to like Act 9? <laughs> I was working on this that whole Great. time. <laughs> and Chihuahua, yeah, look at that thing. Yeah, but it is good. And it is wet. I take it all it back. A little there, was, there was a wet puppet. And that's a to... that's a situation where a little kid goes into the sun and becomes that thing. And then as soon as the, she's out of the sun, she's good. Um, so the, the mom too is like she likes to play in the sun. She likes yeah. to play in the sun even though she shrivels up into a weird little freak. <laughs> she loves it. I told her not to go out there. Yeah. Um. There. When he's wandering through Midian, I know I've, I'm going backwards a little bit mm. here. No, no. I mean, are you? I don't even know. <laughs> We're kind of jumping a little bit all over. Yeah. Here. But uh, he he gets sprayed by like a flower in the version that I watched. And I cannot remember if that happened in the other versions. No, no I don't remember. Yeah, that. I don't think it's like so. he falls asleep in the graveyard, which is kind of weird, I guess. And the first he... time or the second time when the very first, when, before he gets shot, this is like, this, uh, this, yeah, he's no, wandering the around. it's the so fucking cut it is very just moon face and Pelequin being like, Oh, he's here. Oh, oh, yeah. And so, there's a couple people down underground. Being yeah, like, shots of people. Let him in. It's fine. In the, he he is the chosen one. Yeah. And, and the extended Pel version. Pelican's like, nah, fuck this guy. He's meat. I'm gonna eat yeah. him. Uh, or I'm just gonna take one bite. That's all I need. Mm -hmm. But yeah, in the the extended version, he's walking around for a good 15 minutes in the daytime. Oh. And the sun is getting low. <laughs> yeah. and a, a you flower, are not like, selling this version to Jason. <laughs> A flower like violet, like you know, in Hook when the flower sneezes on uh, sure. on Robin Williams, it's like one of those, except he gets covered in dust. And I guess it's implied that that makes him fall asleep, <laughs> and then he falls that makes asleep. sense. And then those guys find him sleeping, and uh, yeah, Peliquin is like, "I want to eat him. He's meat." And the other guys like, "We can't hurt normals. That's, so yeah, if we, if we hurt him, we'll get exiled." And it's against I will the law. say <laughs> another. God, I hate that I'm bringing up these comics that I decided not to read because every review is bad. But again, one of the comics seemed to delineate something where it was like part of why the Nightbreed removes themselves from humanity is they find this, they essentially are like drawn to the meat and right. to be a part of society is very hard for them to control their urges to like to consume people. people. Yeah. Yeah, so they, it's I also think... like they're good because these Nightbreed are good because they've chosen to remove themselves from society, but there are Nightbreed who are still in cities just consuming people and stuff. I think you've provided like more context from those comic books then. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. There, So there is good stuff in them. And like, again, I do think that this is where Clive Barker could tell you, you know, George Lucas style, like this is the wills are microscopic people who live inside <laughs> blood. like i think clive barker probably did have some roadmap uh, not a ton i don't think because like he hasn't been banging out more nightbreed stuff but i do think he had some ideas of like what he wanted of this society and what he thought of like you know where would obviously there's like a moses thing too because it's like you know jews wandering in the desert and he goes off on his own and they're like hopefully we'll see you again Gabal. well if that... you watch through all the hellraisers which one of those is a is a backdoor sequel to, to <laughs> Maybe, there's I mean, like seven of them yeah or probably them, the right? one where henry cavill's playing a vr game <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, just to just to move the plot for we've talked about this already a little bit, but basically Boone gets resurrected with the magic of Midian. Uh, Laurie's looking for I don't know him. If that's true. I think he already had the night breed in him. I think the bite, the bite just woke him up a little. Just woke bit. it up. Yeah, but it oh, also no, he like does at least die role. because yeah. he, he seems to have had a pulse before and then confirmed is a dead body. <laughs> the rest of the movie, the rest of the movie is a corpse. Yeah, yeah. And then Decker is trying to pursue Lori during this this segment as well. Um, yeah. And that's the that the, the scene we already talked about with. You know, she's on a oh, road. Yeah. It turns into a road trip movie for a little she, while. She road trips. <laughs> she borderline leses out with the hottest yeah. slut at the bar. Like, why does that? Again, what is up, eighties? Fuck that. Lori, you you and that woman fuck. You got great yeah. chemistry. And she's like, I'm gonna stay here. It's like, lady, you could fuck Lori also, right now. You know, Lori is asking for it. Could have been a full episode as well, like of a of as mini series of just like the two of them having 
an extended journey together and learning about each other a little bit more. I would have liked to have seen more of that. Four minutes. Oh, for sure. Of that you know story? what? Yeah. I remembered, which I sadly think, God damn it, is from the comics that Peliquin's kind of horny and does yeah, have yeah. sex with like human women. Okay. And I thought, because I was like, oh yeah, this is like a funny thing, right? Where she, like her and Peliquin kind of have a thing, but then she just immediately gets, she Murder. fucks Cronenberg and then Cronenberg knives her to death. Yeah. Kind of a uh, uh, kind of a uh, oh, what's what's good for the goose is not for the gander, huh? It sounds like you're a bit of a breeder yourself, <laughs> Doctor Decker. A night Maybe. breeder. Yeah, <laughs> he wasn't breeding during the day. <laughs> just just nighttime. <laughs> <laughs> He's hanging out at some sleazy roadhouse, waiting for a uh, cabal to be resurrected. This the the weird like rules out of the bathroom, and he like zips up his. <laughs> it, it would be funny you don't see him when she's like oh what a classy man but he's like in the whole outfit <laughs> yeah it's also, also worth saying i love his weird extra long knives they were when real. they cut over to the person sitting they just show like a redneck also like it's yeah like, yeah there. but then she recognizes it right like it's implying that she slept with, with yeah, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. there's also like the weird rules of the actual graveyard that are like can these monsters leave the graveyard? Because when the cops roll up, oh yeah, they're like I the naturals are coming. I don't think it's like a magical rule so much as it is just a rule that they have within their society. Like we don't. Okay. Leave oh yeah, and I mean, there's there's so you're right because that is kind of what they debate. But then there's also like again, they're seeding enough good stuff where mm -hmm. like that the weird man at the the like roadside. A gas station or whatever he knows the night he knows them, yeah. and he's like ah well i knew they'd probably come for them eventually and you're like i don't want, I want to know the relationship between weird yeah. gas station man and peliquin where he's like uh give me some smokes <laughs> peliquin yeah. loves cigarettes he is smoking i'm, I, I'm drunk i need some uh you know a pep and shit buddy i feel like it might have also had some uh thinly veiled racial undertone politics oh for sure no it's, well. it's not thinly really veiled yeah it's, it's yeah they out. definitely are like you know decker me. walks up to boone oh, he's like he's got a gun and, and they it. fucking just unload into him like well like yeah. later in the movie uh there's a like a line where the the sheriff of the town or whatever is is saying like we're killing them because they're different what else reason do we yeah. need and he's saying this to i'm, I'm gonna call him Pat, captain panaka because i can't remember yeah. anything else that he's ever been in uh he's and he looks at him like what the fuck like the look of yeah. a man who's like I oh am yeah than you and i do well. think in 1989 to have your fbi agent be a black man is like a pointed statement mm -hmm. not especially like in Eng when you're shooting in england and stuff like yeah. that is that is a choice and i think he is saying it and then yeah i do think that the again like most guillermo del toro things the night breeds stand in for everybody and they are pretty gay and they are pretty uh whatever else uh <laughs> it, yeah it's basically they, they're they stand in for all other basically yeah mm -hmm. and all people who have like found a community that is then put upon yeah and, and i think also just this idea of like yeah is is it better to hide your community away or is it better to like show yourself and fight which yeah, again it doesn't do... quite do that would be yeah. night free too you know yeah well, also, is Jason, it better to suck? Know, but like Clive Barker is a game. <laughs> no, I didn't yeah. know that. Yes, okay. yes, yes. Yeah, so I did know lot. that. You can also tell by the image on IMDb. <laughs> yeah, it's just him with like. Is he smoking know, cigars? Or a bunch of he's got like a little vest. Yeah. <laughs> it's just him um, making out But he was. All, I will say he was very much the kind of like Rob Halford gay guy, where people would just be like. Ooh, that's a weird guy. Hyper masculine. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Look I, at all I, that I do also think, as much as I like, I My wish. Man. I wish Clive Barker had great health and could produce a million more things. I do also remember that he was really good friends with Bill Maher and was always on that show. And I'm mm. like, I do think we've saved ourselves Real some, time. from some uh, perhaps spicy opinions for Mr. Barker. <laughs> Mr. Barker uh, yeah. Thanks to him hiding in a castle. And well, uh, we all know that Bill Maher you know, definitely boned. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> for sure, right? I mean, I don't know, though. I think a little D might cure Bill Maher's. That's brain worms, you know? Yeah, like, I think Bill Maher has fucking fell off for the last <laughs> 25 years. He used to be hyper left and now he's like weirdly right, even though he still has like a left wing view. Anyway. He just hates um, people who are under the age of 40, I think. It's like it's Yeah. Like... I think that's gonna happen to all of us realistically. I think it's better uh -oh. to I think it's better to bang before Baphomet uh at the at the feet of Baphomet than it is to just bang out in the fields though. 
you know. <laughs> I prefer I prefer to bang in front of the Leviathan. Well, yeah, my skin is all being ripped off and put onto a pillar. Of I mean, the Leviathan, to its credit, is a cool floating like crystal crystal yeah. that has those chains. <laughs> That's true. The chains are part of Baphomet. No, it does. It does fuck up that doctor. It doesn't. Yep. Uh, that guy thinks Leviathan's gonna love him, and it does not. Whereas Cabal I, is kind of worried about Baphomet, and he's like, "You're cool." Yeah, I, I think, think Baphomet is a, probably a better god. I, I think Leviathan is is like an unemotional, Though, logical like, I, creation or whatever. Again, dangling thread I do like is I do think that that the actor that plays the priest is super interesting, mm-hmm, and yeah. I do like that it's like l- listen, Baphomet blesses Cabal, and he becomes this guy, and Baphomet's blood gets on the other guy, and he becomes apparently Satan, <laughs> or yeah. and then it's like I do like that it's like which guy is right? I don't really know because they both seem blessed in a way by Baphomet. I think Disney needs to buy the rights to this whole oh, uh, both the Hellraiser universe and the Night uh, I universe will say if it was with an Fox, MCU. It was a Fox movie, so Disney may own the rights to Nightbreed. That's actually, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, and Disney was, yeah, whatever he was developing all through the '90s after Nightbreed was Disney related. Yeah, another like strange thing about this movie is like half, not even halfway, like past halfway, we're then introduced to a whole new slew of characters that like mm-hmm. have been absent mm-hmm. or just not even needed up until this point. They're like, well, now we're introducing a whole new jail cell situation with a sheriff and yeah. a bunch of deputies and a crazy priest who's been locked up. Yeah, and also the priest. I tried to look really deep in my mind, and uh, Steve, you're more a comics guy, though. I don't know, Jason. He. <laughs> looks like the human version of the preacher comic and i'm yeah, like did yeah, they just yeah. draw this Not friggin him. guy maybe, yeah. <laughs> like he just preacher is like 80s preacher right in the... yeah oh maybe yeah maybe it predates it maybe you're right it's is a possible it... day oh you were saying the other way around possibly like it was yeah. him. you know like let's just oh, 95 yeah like he's just right. like oh, hey i like this niche dumb movie and the yeah. guy that played the priest let me just basically draw him <laughs> and i mean I that's know. That's that not threw me off. There, and I was kind of like, is that a thing? And is that a thing yeah. where Clive Barker would be like, like, is it a handshake deal that this is the same priest? Or no, it's not. <laughs> I didn't find anything. And uh, I don't know. Sometimes you just, as an illustrator, you you find something visually that you find intriguing and you just kind of steal yeah. it and don't tell anyone. <laughs> oh, yeah. Why? Why not? I, yeah. I will say, Jason, too, that is a sequence that, like, and I'm not the pickiest man on earth when it comes to filmmaking but i went back two or three times to the scene where uh cabal slash whatever the hell his name is before is being beaten by the cops aaron boone aaron boone there you go boone slash cabal boone. and the priest is what i guess is squeezing his fist so tight that he cuts into his That's own his paw. when he's in that room yeah he's he's but doing this the and... way it's shot and cut makes no goddamn sense uh and it's wild like it, that is just a basic sequence where you should be showing me that this guy is like Man, i yeah. can't hear it anymore i can't whatever but it's right. just like they show the priest he kind of makes a fist they show Cabal because I'm like, oh, is he getting stigmata from Cabal? Like, is he a night I breed? Took, that I is took feeling... that character as he um, was fed up with the faith and mm. fed up with the religion and going a little bit crazy and knew something yeah. was Why up. Is he in jail. I don't oh, know. He probably yeah. punched He's a guy. Great. They did say that he was like losing it. He's lost and yeah. I do think, like, this is again, this is where I think this this movie is both like. <laughs> modern day franchise pilled in a way that hurts it yeah but then i do yeah. think that it's got a hundred percent the cool ass star wars shit from the 70s mm-hmm. where it's just like you can come up with all this yep. like it does leave it leaves the perfect amount of threads where you as somebody who is kind of enjoying the ride can you think create, so you hard yeah you yeah. you are filling in so many blanks yeah. and like i think you are arguably like you know give me 50 percent less blanks and this is a great movie. I think, like, but, yeah. one thing that you said to me, Kay, I, th- I saw The Force Awakens with you mm. on the first time I saw it. And uh, mm-hmm. afterwards, <laughs> we were walking out of the theater. I was going to be like, they have jetpacks? Wrong one. <laughs> you were like, you know, the movie was fine, but give me more of that red devil robot guy. I want to know what he's up to. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, yeah, that's true. That's what Star Wars is. is you you do want to know. And that's, uh, to go back to what you said, I do think that they, 
the cantina sequence is shot a bit weird because they're like, let's just do one one minute of unadulterated of like, shots of, of aliens different like, aliens. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I really have that. <laughs> I've been trying to take significantly le less notes for these like reviews mm, because sure. I have sort of identified that it is more of a roundtable discussion. We don't need to go over every minute detail. And I found myself watching this movie in a really interesting way where I was just like not taking notes on purpose because I wanted to put it through my short term memory directly into my long term memory in a more natural mm -hmm. way. And I think that ultimately this movie is going to stick with me for the exact reasons you're talking about, because yeah. I just want to know more about this universe. Like, I just want. Yeah. Well, that's the point. More we're of this. And so. that is like, yeah. You can fill in those blanks and you can create mm. your stories creatively in your mind. As like creative people, you sit down and you're like, I can imagine what Moonhead is doing on Saturday. Someone's sitting on that moon face, I bet. But he's you also hanging have, out with like, the moon from McDonald's. They go to he, he's got a face thing. like he's got a face like a saddle. You find the woman with the X or Y <laughs> dog. And oh man, that. yeah, that lady from the bar. She yeah, loved moon face. But yeah, he, no, he's hanging out with Max tonight. They moon kiss. They have like weird yeah. moon kisses. D Doug Jones himself. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah but uh, yeah, it's. I do think, and, and I think that there's something to that. And I do think that's also what you see in this documentary where it's like, like it does kind of break my heart that there just wasn't maybe the narrative to, to make this a great movie, but right. you see what everyone says, like what Clive Barker told them about their weird individual characters. And actually even like what I said, the, the lady I liked much, Shuna Sassy, she's like, I'm a dancer. I'm not an actor. I was on my way out the door forever performing. This is like her only movie. Right. And she just said that the choreographer was a guy who had worked with her as a dancer. And he's like, listen, we have this listing for like a sensual person that moves like this. And yeah. she said, I wasn't much of an actor, but Clive Barker essentially told me like, I want you to do this, this, and this. And she's like, I truly like studied gymnastics and aerobics for like months just to right. get my body to be the way it was. But I think everybody had that. Like weirdly, everyone kind of says that, you know, Clive Barker sat them down for 30 minutes and said, hey, yeah. do whatever you want but this is kind of what I want out of this person. And I do think that that gives you something. And I think Lucas does that too, right? Where he's just like, yeah. I'm going to give you enough. And I think maybe uh, John James Abrams or whatever the <laughs> hell those stand for didn't do that. Because it's like, yeah, I, we saw plenty of, uh, you know, Gleep Glorp's bar and friggin' Force Awakens. That's true, yeah. We saw a lot of Kit Fistos and we didn't care. Yeah, I think J.J. Yeah. J. Abrams had an idea in his head of what Star Wars was, and he wanted to realize that exact notion without... And that sort of begets the sort of issue with Star Wars now, where, like, everybody has I, an I, idea I, let's, of what, let's, what Star Wars let's is. Yeah. I know, <laughs> it, it, that's a can of worms. Yeah, that's a can yeah. of worms. No, but let's, this uh, movie it has a very uh, distinct vision, sure. right? It just, yeah, it's porcupine execution. woman slash bird woman <laughs> is naked. Yeah, uh, like it in her quills knock you out or kill you or one kill you. Yeah, one thing I, I wanted to mention about her character, which I thought was like so mind-bogglingly interesting to me, is that she also dreams about him, right? Like he had yeah, her in again. his nightmares, and she's dreaming <laughs> about him in her night nightmares. I guess like again, a brutal thread though, where you're like, shit, shoot, yeah, it, and like it, this should have been. The thing should have been maybe that he was torn between Lori, the human who is not Promidian, and Porcupine, and Porcupine woman who he's been dreaming about his entire life. Mm -hmm. And the dream seems mostly to be about her. Mm -hmm. like, like it seems deeply that it is her being horny and thrusting towards the screen. True, yeah, like I mean, the opening makes it seem like she's trying to murder him and he's scared, right? But like And I can, believe that's the dream, right? Like yeah. the opening is meant to be the dream. I think so, yeah. But you could you could explore that, show the dreams more and have there be weird sensuality to the dreams that goes beyond a horror movie and into something more erotic that would then, you know, link them together in a in a way that would probably develop both characters a little bit more interestingly but again yeah. there's so much going on and, in this and movie. yeah i mean they also that's the thing the uh palanquin and her have a relationship that i don't know if it showed much in the ultimate cut but there's yeah like they a they bit do. of a sex scene that they kind of do the bill murder or the like ghostbusters blowjob on <laughs> where you see it in the director's <laughs> cut for like one and a half seconds they have a yeah. they have a, a makeout moment but it's mm -hmm. you know it's it's more almost feels like a Han Solo Princess Leia final kiss moment where it's like the battle starting where we might both be <laughs> that dead. Would, that would be good. 
I love you. I know. I know. I know. I know. I know. That should have been the guy whose face yeah. is down his gut. Or he, or he's just like, <laughs> you're just meat to me. Yeah. I love you. You're meat. <laughs> uh goodness uh, yeah what a yeah but I, I it is very strange jason though and i do think that i i compare it a lot to star wars in that way just because those i think we all are the age where we lived through you know enough of being a, a kid in the pre prequels universe where yeah, i've been alive for to... like most of all of the star wars movies except for two i think right mm. so like i think what year is jedi 82 Okay. 81. I've been alive. Okay. I've been alive for six of them. It's the same as <laughs> oh, you guys. The same as the rest. I thought for some reason in my head just for a second, I was like, yeah, it was You're really like, I'm I'm an old <laughs> man. My head hurts. I was we were all I there. Was born through. in 1977. Those mm-hmm. re-releases though were pretty prominent in the 90s, right? And then you know, That's yes. true, yeah. Yeah. The saga began again. And uh, but this movie, I I think that it needs nine movies. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's that's the thing is like I think I was also gonna say is like I can say that I think that there is no great version of this movie and also say I really want that TV show. Yeah. Yeah. Like and I yeah, it's like and I don't like I just there's not a specific problem in the movie, I think. Like I say, I, I don't know that Barker was necessarily the strongest filmmaker just because of like literal technical chops. Yeah. But like, yeah, he set the stage for something. That is cool, and you, and it's shocking that there wasn't like an FX show in two thousand and one. That's yeah. yeah. That was like, you know, showing us multiple episodes of like figuring out the Decker's the killer. Remember the Pelican then, episode, guys? Man, that yeah. was crazy. His origin. And what if he was like yeah. running into one? Like, what if just Moonface was on the street and he's like, "No, I'm just seeing things, man." Yeah, like what if your what if your psychiatrist? <laughs> I could make a whole show about what if your psychiatrist was a serial killer who is setting you up as a patsy via like hallucinogenics. Forget yeah. that you are dreaming of a monster world that's real <laughs> that the psychiatrist. I think that out. yeah, that would be like the end of season one yeah Yeah. you find out Midian's real the i think this the weakest part of the movie is also the strongest part of the movie is that there's way too much going on in it yeah for you to be able to properly enjoy everything is i do think a lot of clive barker and that's like i think hellraiser does a pretty good job of being like we're gonna barely tell you a damn thing yeah. Like you do not know they are called Cenobites. You do not know anything. You do not know what you have to figure that out for yourself. It's later. all and, and it's like you do not know what that thing that flips down from the door frame and goes. <laughs> that sucks. You need that's an awesome. internet that does not exist yet. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. The, is the mind, and that's mind that's internet. like what works. And yeah, he's maybe just dipping a little too much. Uh, yeah, and I mean, I love. There's the one creature that's just like. A, it's just it reminds me a lot of uh, big trouble in little china where like the beholder comes out like there's right. a fr- there's a freaking beholder here and that opens a whole <laughs> new can of worms like yeah. what is this flying disc uh, yeah. whatever yeah. the fuck there, there's that kind of shit down here this I place was is about connected to Beirut. Yeah. I was thinking about Big Trouble in Little China a lot during this movie. As oh well. yeah, Pretty another cool. movie that is know, like uh, is wacky, know. and they never made a sequel. And there's yeah. like, oh, it, it asks more questions than yeah. answers, and it's a weird kids movie. But like yeah. adults were probably like, "This is not for kids. This is crazy." Yeah, yeah. Like we don't often get the like you know twenty pounds of shit in a ten pound bag yeah. <laughs> style narrative, and it doesn't. It still doesn't work. But it doesn't work in a way that is, you, you know, it's the old, uh, the old, the Benoit Blanc thing of like, it, it's stupid, but it compels me, you know, yeah. like, I can't I help like it, but, but I don't know why. Yeah. yeah, I can't help but imagine my own adventures in Nightbreed. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, that's why we talk dumb. about these. It's just dumb. <laughs> That's why we yeah. talk about these kinds of movies. Actually, th- it's interesting. I uh, after I finished this movie today, I threw on yoga hosers. Okay, <laughs> and it's a it's a bad movie. And I told you guys I talked about this. And the only reason I want to say this is this. I drew I draw a, a sort of connection here where in the eighties and nineties it seemed like filmmakers were making movies uh, that live in our minds in infamy. That we that that's sort of the conceit of the show to begin with. Like you're at a party, you talk to a person. And you're kind of like, hey, did you, you remember this weird thing? I think that Yoga Hosers was created by Kevin Smith to be a Gen Z version of that. So in 20 years after the movie was made, like the movie is surprisingly competent 
and it's just weird and kind of like the dialogue's bad and it's just kind of like bad in a way that's like in 20 years are you going to be at a party and be like do you remember yoga or should we collectively hallucinate <laughs> the existence of this thing in 20 years at a party if i say do you remember yoga Hoshu? and the person says yes I, I'm, getting her, <laughs> I'm getting them pregnant that night even if that's I'm what i'm saying and even I think if i'm night, 60 <laughs> un unintentionally movies like night breed or oh, Big yeah. Trouble in little china they fall into that sort of category and and it, it's this movie makes so little sense at times that you're 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 like Steve was saying, you're connecting these dots. You were saying as well, uh, Cam. You're connecting these dots that don't exist because you you're you're so weirdly bored, but captivated by that boredom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I don't know you if I would say bored. I don't think this not movie is bored. I think bored way, is but... yeah. I think bored is the wrong word, but like confused. <laughs> yeah, and I do think you're also hitting on something that I think like this movie came out in 1990 1990 so imagine year. if this movie was a flop and and usually probably gets like one or two runs of vhs mm -hmm. i don't think it actually got much of a dvd run until the cabal cut came which is like 2015 mm -hmm. so like this is a movie that had a literal cult like mm -hmm. and again, they went nuts producing an art book that was at my library that now runs for like five hundred dollars on Amazon. <laughs> like it's there, yeah. It's a it's a movie that I think just had that ephemera and could have a cult, and you could collect twenty five comics from Epic Comics and be like of a movie that you could talk to a girl at a bar and she'd be like, "The what? The night? Yeah. Like what the I'm fuck sorry. are you talking about?" And then oh, my um, parents accidentally like, I'm getting a, I'm getting a text and I have to go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what if this was on TV and you yeah, saw okay. it as a kid and you were like, well, I saw a movie yeah. where a man's face was in his stomach. And I <laughs> UHF watched. was that? Like, sure. you know who yeah. Weird Al is, but you're like, remember UHF? Yeah. And they're like, what? And the Weird Al movie from yeah. 1988. And they're and like, I, what? <laughs> I even think that Weird Al, except for like the, that brief period in the 90s where he was like the top. And also in Canada, it's weird because we had him on Much Music. We, but, yeah. We but I do think that Weird Al was a thing where it took the internet for people to be like, hey, wait a minute. Do we? all like weird <laughs> like yeah even the from yeah. cool people to losers we all agree that he's pretty good and that was like yeah. oh yeah uh, we all like weird al he's a completely unproblematic king uh <laughs> but yeah i wanted to say also there's i read a i want to uh play the tune about me being too intellectual because i recently read a book uh that is series <laughs> yeah there he is. i haven't heard chucky all night wow uh I read a book by which I mean, of course, I read a graphic novel uh, by Box <laughs> Brown. Uh, but he does these kind of uh, biography slash uh, history graphic novels and did one called The He-Man Effect, How American Toy Makers Sold, sold You Your Childhood. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's about essentially marketing to children and also just the development of marketing. The which Toys like, That Made Us is a... Yeah, yeah. So he actually even talks about the toys that made us. Uh, but he has a very interesting theory in the book because he kind of draws from the development of marketing around World War I through whatever. And then there's kind of the fight in the 70s and 80s about marketing children and what like He-Man and She-Ra and like all Transformers, G.I. Joe kind of gets into all of that. But he also kind of points out that that is sort of the last time because uh, he talks about a lot about brain development and, and imagination and like what you require uh to enjoy like imaginative play as a kid and that essentially like disney and everybody has screwed themselves by so nicely inserting like a narrative into our imaginative play but that had very specific limits so now when you see star wars or when you see transformers you can feel well that's not Star, like that's not transformers right like like i know the limits i've been that's not the one that i'm spending like. my whole mm -hmm. life imagining different stories but within yeah. a set of parameters and so that's kind of his interesting thing and i do wonder that like i do think nightbreed is kind of that 70s and 80s feel where it's like they don't set too many parameters yeah. so it really is is up to you to imagine and it lets your imagination run with the ideas and that's kind of the problem with modern stuff is they don't they're afraid to let your imagination go too far. I'm a fan of professional wrestling. Oh, and really? I have been, I ha what? I have been for th about 30... Uh, even Naked Midian? <laughs> about 30 years. 
and rest the that context has changed so many times. <laughs> and I this love it. character existed at the height of wrestling popularity, of the all time height of Rock Austin, Naked Midian. Okay, <laughs> so it the context for wrestling alone has changed that many times in that same like i know i know who my favorite wrestlers are and they did talked a certain way and they wrestled a certain way the and gobbledygooker we, number one number one uh he debuted this year he debuted at survivor series he's 1990. back the gobbledygooker no, is back in 1990 when this oh, movie okay. took place who knows <laughs> i don't know uh it's but yeah, because that, that... it's England standing in for Northern Alberta. <laughs> <laughs> but that was a really that's a really good uh, that's a really good way to look at it. And I think that if Nightbreed was created now, the fans would hate it. They'd be like, "That's not it. That sucks." Yeah, I mean, that's the tough thing is it's like I do want that show, but it's also like AMC's Nightbreed. Why is it on AMC? That's the channel that had. Uh, that Why had is Breaking Austin Bad. Butler Cabal? Every character you, you just named like one of the most <laughs> beloved shows of all time. Uh, no i i'm well i think that like to your point cam it's still happening it's gonna happen forever right like star wars is the thing i mean Mm -hmm. even the acolyte now is like people are just i know able to like it but i even feel like i even feel that where i'm like you told me this was gonna be a hundred years before the previous (laughs) and it looks the fucking same and i played fucking fall of jedi fallen order and they showed a cool robot and you ain't even got those fucking robots where are my cool robots like where are the art deco robots that seem kind of cool yeah i I mean but i i understand it i get it but it's it's an unfortunate reality right like we Mm. can't we're not no and 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 i do think that that's also like yeah, I do wonder if yeah, but then at the same time, does any uh, did uh, Gen Z kids don't even night breed anymore? They just eat ass. <laughs> yeah, they just eat ass. They're going to ask about like that's what night breading means 90. now. Oh my god, yeah, <laughs> yeah. They rose up and Necker uh, wouldn't even have to kill toilet. Gen Z because he'd be like, "You I guys are on TikTok too long." It is. It's one of those. Yo, things girl, where, like, use as me as the skibby toilet. As, as much as we're talking about, that's Halloween true. The, the skibbity toilet would be in Midian. Oh God, I'm gonna make <laughs> a one of the new monsters. For... Anytime we say skibbity toilet, now we're gonna make a <laughs> noise of an old man falling over. Am I here? Well, we uh, need to appeal to Twitch. I <laughs> fell off the skibbity toilet because of all my riz. Uh, my, my riz uh, weighed me down. <laughs> adding yeet to that is especially pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right because that's from like vines originally anyway yeah uh let me all just your you skibbity toilet are belong to <laughs> are us, belong to us. <laughs> uh mr bean uh yeah we already kind of covered <laughs> this next part <laughs> but uh you know night breed struggle decker convinces local law enforcement to raid midian uh boone emerges emerges as the leader he's defending the midian from the human attackers and then we get the cinematic battle uh, that the Nightbreed, uh, you know, defend themselves against the humans, but Boone kind of has to teach them how to fight because they they're such a they, they're weird demons from the Nether Realm of They've the Shadow. They've been down Walkers, there so long they don't remember how to fight. But but they're like peaceful is what is the vibe that I got. But they have the berserkers. <laughs> their berserkers are all. uncontrollable. That's uncontrollable why nightmares. Earth, uh, but beneath the sub Earth, it's like sub Midian. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and th- but I mean, like, they're all monsters with ways of consuming humans. And like, you know, the guy who I don't know if this is in the cut or not that you watch, but the guy who has little snakes that come out of his belly, there's a scene where he essentially uses the snakes as like uh, hypnotism tism de- devices. They like they hypnotize a guy so that he can uh, he can eat him. Basically. Well, he does this thing. Where, it's like a like... reverse snake charmer where he uses snakes to charm you. <laughs> Yeah, they come out of his belly and then they wrap around his neck. But did they? Use, did is that when they? So in the in the cut that I watched, they they come up and they go around him and then he's like staring at the guy and then the snakes kind of go in front of him and they have an eyeball in each mouth and then the guy kind of like gets hypnotized by the snakes and then no, he, I would have rem- yeah. I would have remembered that. Yeah, I, I was. It's also the music, or sorry, the sound all cuts out at that moment. So I'm like, I think they added this, but the, um the quality of the of the shots were still quite high so i'm like i think this might be added for specifically the version i'm watching that these guys aren't going to see right now but it, it shows that they had so, so you, you can imagine this guy 
um, this we'll call him Snake Belly. Uh, Old he, Snake Belly. Yeah, Snake Belly. <laughs> you can imagine like how he would use that power to devour humans if he were out in you know whatever whatever his hunting ground would be uh, to hypnotize people to make them docile in order to to eat, devour them. Oh Which man, is... would you believe that Snake Belly's quote, his '90s quote of "There goes the neighborhood," <laughs> is it on IMDb quotes? That it's seems not. Like it must be for the trailer, right? He, yeah, he also he has a lot of one-liners. His whole he thing is definitely. Like, I think he pulls it off. He yeah. pulls it off better than the face. But yeah, like as Jason was saying, it's the all we have is the weird part where like, wait, your tentacles have eyes, and they're stabbing out that guy's eyes. Mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because I remember that the part eyes where they... It'd be funny if it spit out the old eyes and took his eyes yeah. and a new eye. <laughs> like a hermit crab. And then yeah. it tipped the guy. Thank you. <laughs> Boom, uh, I, I only have change. change. <laughs> this this segment too, like it, a lot happens in this. It, yeah, which so, sucks kind of, but is I get. I mean, they do have the rope bridge fight, which kind of rolls. Well, that final battle reminds me of a more modern movie final battle they go kind of fast now with those end moments yeah. and it's more about the there's also like a right large after. chunk of the movie that we're skipping over that i suppose could just i mean we're skipping over because it doesn't nothing really happens no and yeah. it's all over the fucking place i mean yeah, it, you introduced the, the shitty cop the priest who, yeah all who these has, who has a militia and I yeah. do like him because it's just like, you know, it's like introducing Darth Vader. Where you're just yeah. Like, hey, you want to kill all these fucking guys? Oh, listen, buddy. I got a whole good. army. No problem. He's, he's got a, a Michael Rooker energy to him. He's got yeah. like kind of like a little. No, like a shitty like Michael Rooker has like high T. This is like low T Michael Rooker. <laughs> right. Like, yeah. Eh. You know, hey. my wife, my wife doesn't sleep with me anymore, yeah. but I've got a million Claymore mines somewhere in a shack <laughs> my mom, in Alberta. Yeah. My wife keeps asking me for an open relationship, and I keep yeah. saying no, but she keeps <laughs> asking me anyway. My uh, wife dates Pal and Quinn. <laughs> Do you guys know what a cucking means? Yeah. And uh, he, even his voice is kind of like comically high for a lot of it. Mm. Like when he's doing the the low talking, he has a little bit of menace to him. Like he really, yeah. he just like like yeah, he is good. Like he he seems like a creepy sadist, and actually the yeah. the bit with cabal is pretty creepy considering you're like listen i know that this is monster jesus i know he's probably gonna be fine but but he does a good job of beating the shit out of him in his cell yeah and, and he's doing it for like personal reasons he he definitely has a, a yeah a he's just like a killer life. in my neighborhood yeah. Yeah. exactly and i do it, like the weird bit with the cop and the doctor where the doctor's yeah. like, this man has no pulse, he's dead, and the cop just shoots him. Because <laughs> he's like, oh shit, I can get away with even worse police yeah. abuses? No well, problem. Just <laughs> he's already yeah. got a couple of bullet holes in him. Yeah, real real ACAB movie, for sure, <laughs> except for the one FBI agent. <laughs> but, uh... Yeah. Um... I mean, also there just to continuously hard pencil underline, you know, humans are the monsters here, not the monsters. It's the humans that are monsters. Yeah. Um, it is funny that also that last battle that we were talking about has both <laughs> the, the FBI agent being like, hey, this is fucked up. And the priest being like, there are women and children, yeah. mostly. <laughs> most of them, uh, yeah. There's a couple that can kill us, but the most of the people are running to yeah. hide from you. Just Yeah, you know, you know uh, we might hit a little harder these days, but uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm not saying anything, Twitch. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. Don't say uh, it. I'd follow, also like to follow Hassan Piker for more information. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to point out too that like all of the monsters in this whole universe are fucking sick and twisted nightmares. And uh when Cabal changes, he's just like still handsome. Just yeah, uh, I do think that that, small tattoos that kind of sucks. Yeah. Especially when he's like, Don't look at me. <laughs> it's so funny. Like it's like, got, wait, you're just a shirtless hunk? Yeah. yeah. I don't know <laughs> if it's right there. It's because they designed all of the, the the look of Cabal before they had him, you know, to work with. But they should the way that his sh face is shaped as an actor. I don't know if you've seen him recently. He looks more or less the same, you know. Just yeah, I, and again, yeah, that, his it's a funny Victor one where I'm like, fun. I don't. Yeah, he's kind of an actor that is just like fully fine. Like I, I yeah. don't think he's a bad actor. I don't think he's a great actor. Uh, he's. It seems like he's more of a theater guy, but yeah, yeah. very, very handsome. You can't deny very that handsome, he's yeah. like a handsome leading man type. But he also has uh, this sort of like large, 
lower jaw, right? Like yeah, he has, he's lantern, big lantern jaw. Yeah, yeah he's yeah. got like the the his head is shaped like a shoebox, but like it's in a good way, in a good way. But it seems <laughs> it seems in a good way. Made. I want to I want to <laughs> fuck that shoebox. <laughs> <laughs> what kind his, of shoes you got in that box, <laughs> Mister? His face hey. seems. His face seems built to have orc teeth. Like he should have big orc <laughs> teeth. That come yeah, out. I see it. Am I, I wrong? Know, yeah. Am I wrong? No, you're this, this, right. this whole chat has devolved into deviant art so quick. I want Do him you know to have kind of under like jaw me? tusks that come up like a warthog. I think he should have warthog yeah. teeth, and I think it would have made it nightbreed look cooler. But he kind of looks like yeah. Steve Ranazassi. Oh yeah. For sure, he's like handsome. Steve I, ran his ass. Yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah. Like less freaky looking. No, yeah, he's and, not that and, he's all, <laughs> and, and he also never claimed he did nine eleven or whatever. But, uh, <laughs> no, he he said he was in the building during nine eleven, and that's why he got canceled. Right. Yeah, he got he, uh, he, got, he took a warp whistle this. out of there. Look at yeah. that! Telling me you're telling me that some bottom jaw work teeth wouldn't let it make him look cool as heck. I don't know. That's just me, but no, it's was true. This, and, and I do. This, with demon character doing blackface? That's a conversation. <laughs> I mean, I mean, there's a uh, couple. Palanquin, yeah. I, I was a little shocked to find out that that was a white British. Man. Yeah, I actually, it was funny when you're like, Tanaka's in this, and I was like, oh, Palanquin. And then I was like, <laughs> oh, no, it's the cop. Okay. Yeah. Her, her. Uh, I. When I watched it, I was like, I can tell that this is a guy doing a voice. So, like, I, I wasn't mm. that shocked to find out that it was a, a white British man. But he's definitely doing a certain type of an, Amer an American accent that, uh, you know, is particularly yeah, yeah. coded. I, yeah, I think it's fine. It, it, yeah. I, oh, yeah. You're right there. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, it feels feels a way. But I also think that it actually speaks to shitty British TV and the fact that you make every Klingon a black person for a while. Yeah, stuff, that's you know? true. Yeah. There, there's something to be said of uh, who we make our night breed, Jason. Yeah. yeah. The Ferengi as well as another, another race. That's going to be my my closing question to you guys is like, if you were a night breed, what night breed would you be? <laughs> if you were a night water? breed, what time of day would you breed? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh yeah, yeah, Craig Schaefer's really interesting because he's like continued to act. Here's uh, a question. Here's a note that I wrote. Actually, it's not really a question. Uh, old face rip talks about the berserkers who will rip out your head and shit down your neck. So Duke Nukem actually mm. loves two movies. He loves They Live and he loves <laughs> Night Breeze. <laughs> yeah. I don't know that this is the origin of rip on your head and shit down your neck, but I think Duke, yeah, Duke Nukem uh, has admitted at this point. Yeah, no, if you if, you if you play uh, Duke Duke Nukem Forever at the end of the game, he says, "My favorite movie, Nightbreed." <laughs> yeah. He does. And also, they live. What, what, when you tip the stripper five Groovy. times in a row, he goes, "You should watch the Cabalga." <laughs> <laughs> I know you might have seen this movie on cable, but <laughs> there's a better uh, cut. Have you seen the ultimate cabal cut on YouTube? Yeah. All right. That's incredible. You, you remind me of this stripper that's like a porcupine. <laughs> uh, uh I love I, the Baphomet statue. I, I think we were pretty much talking. Yes, about I, I do like that too. That and that they, it's cool, also yeah. kind of implied. That also feels like a video game thing where it's like kind it's of implied deteriorating it's part of his too. body. Like it, some of it yeah. is his body, and some of it's a statue. And yeah. and I Doesn't do he like wink that. at one point. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, <Ding>. uh, <laughs> and it's like, yeah, heal me. Yeah, like be you know beyond i do like that quest again that's fuck a, fuck a two movie quest where it's like yeah. find the new midian and bring me back to life like jesus never had to do that god wasn't like hey jesus can you make me flesh again not, not to keep going back to like making this into a series but if they did do it they could even just make it the same amount of time that's passed in the Nightbreed universe to now. Oh, for sure. Still be interesting, you know? They could have. Yeah. And again, like you say, Craig Schaefer looks the same age. He should either be the Decker or he's got to be something. Or he's, or he's, he's the, the crazy character. cop. Yeah. Or maybe the he's, show takes maybe he's the, in like 1999. He's the, he's the new of eyeball guy. And cool he's like the wise, show. he's the yeah. wise, uh, he's the wise in Nightbreed now. Yeah. It's like uh, the guy in uh, Battlestar Galactica where they brought him back and he's right. like the, the old Cylon. Yeah. 
Oh, it's the possibilities. Um, yeah. But, you know, it'll never happen, even though I really wanted to. I do wonder, though, that that's also the thing. Like, like, there are a lot of these authors that are like, you know, their stuff is pretty unapproachable. I, I think Lovecraft's a good example. Yeah. I think Gaiman is a pretty good example. Yeah. But, you know, it, it just takes the right artist, you know? And, and I, I think, I do yeah, think... if anything, time has proven that, like, the things that we've thought have been unapproachable are not quite as unapproachable as we think, as long as mm. we approach them from a different angle that people aren't really expecting us to go in yeah and uh, honestly the other uh, the weirdest thing with nightbreed is like it's hard to imagine it with not uh practical effects for the mo like yeah how do yeah. you do the monsters you know which is also a thing that you know is in the last you know 10 years or so people have started to to re realize is is the way to go and appreciate more and mm. it's it's kind of leaning back in that direction which is super refreshing yeah. um yeah, I don't get know. Alex Winter on the blower. I think we're also all ignoring that there's a great later adaptation of Nightbreed uh, called Hotel Transylvania. <laughs> that, that was my follow up. That was my follow up answer for that uh, cantina yeah. question I had earlier. Uh, <laughs> the Blobby, yeah. the Frankenstein. Yeah. They're all there. Yeah, everyone's there. The Invisible it's a, Man. It's a hidden place for monsters to be. You couldn't see uh, him, but Hotel he was there. Transylvania. The mummy. Clive Barker, I know you're in the chat. Tell us what you think yeah. of Hotel Transylvania. Yeah, Clive Barker on your deathbed. Tell us what you're what you're thinking now. You, no, it's not. I, I, at this point, is at least not his death, deathbed because he's been dying for about uh, for a long time. Yeah. Twelve. Oh, years. he's he's written in the chat modern feminist masterpiece. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Okay. I'm sorry about those Bill Maher comments earlier. It sounds like you're <laughs> woke AF, sir. <laughs> um oh i liked how so the mob forms uh they there's that scene where he's just like perving out over all the different weapons they're showing different oh, like AK this is also a thing. right 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 it's like mm. the the classic it, this is very cartoonish too jason you were talking about cartoony stuff really this is so mm. cartoony like in some movies it's cool in some movies it's goofy and this movie it is absolutely goofy as fuck because he's so well proud this whole of this like eight minutes reminds me a little bit of like the last couple uh michael myers movies the last couple halloween's right, where like yeah. mobs getting oh, I thought you meant like austin powers yeah. movies <laughs> or mob austin, yeah. austin powers mob austin powers but when they're oh my god driving, austin powers um... ends with evil dies tonight and they just kill <laughs> <laughs> when they're driving through Killing like Dr. that evil yeah when they're driving through that like wooded <laughs> like street area and the cars are just all over the road like just for some reason i was captivated by the fact oh yeah that they're driving so fast so chaotically and they're just trying to get there to just murder these oh monsters. and that is the like uh again depressingly prescient thing where it's like now more than it, like this is just a weird mega mob of uh <laughs> like <laughs> preppers like preppers who have been waiting yeah. for uh, a thing, a thing a of civil monsters. war. Like, yeah. It would be yeah. so much easier to explain this rural cop who has a million minds and a militarized police force for no reason Today that just has, has been yeah. foaming at the mouth for a city full of monsters yeah. to destroy. It like, is wild to think yeah. about. Yeah, like how you know, remember like the doomsday prepper TV shows that were on when we were like teenagers and early twenties and stuff, and we're like, these people are fucking crazy. And now it's like, oh. These people are... I kind of wish they had a bomb yeah. filled and, with yeah, sure. KD. And I also think that it's like you could be way more explicit. Like it's surprising yeah. that these guys aren't like white supremacists or you yeah. know, you, you could be oh, they were, they just didn't show that on TLC. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's I find that part very fascinating. And yeah, again, and also it's like funny because I, I, like you were saying, the the night breed are, are mostly peaceful, but they really get the upper hand because these guys are stupid dumb as shit yeah the like again <laughs> quill lady being like doo -doo -doo -doo, and it's like oh titties and she just like, hey, she kills yeah, like Mauga. 10 guys yeah uh, so stupid just shoot the monster you've all got ak-47 but then like so this is another thing is this also felt added but i i couldn't be certain uh the the part where they're sort of like first uh casing the upper mer meridia or meridia mer what is it called <laughs> Midian. 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 Uh, I want to say Meridian every time. Here, let me help you. Oh, there we go. I forgot that. that <laughs> I kind of feel bad. Like he, sh they should have just to be nice, given him a larger fanny pack. You know, <laughs> give him like a Celtic sporan. Yeah. 
Yeah, <laughs> you know, give the man some shame. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, there's there's a sequence where they're first casing um, Midian, and one of the cops is like a nervous, like <laughs> kind of guy. Yeah, and he just starts like shooting randomly, and you know, he almost shoots Panaka in the side of the head, and everybody's like, "You fucking." NPC cuck dildo and like they, they grab him and throw him off to the side and then uh when he sees the guy explode he starts barfing and everything right and this is when they start to realize the magic is incurred but like did that all happen in your cut because it, it seemed very uh, yeah there yeah. was oh, yeah. there was actually a lot of that yeah at one point the Michael Rooker like main cop local cop guy calls the priest the F slur also mm, which is we've done yeah. a lot of movies where we were expecting that word to come up but also, and... you know, my marker does that a lot because he's like, "Remember, this is a bad." Yeah, word. yeah, yeah, for sure. I and I do. I, Clyde Barker is also a very fascinating character where I think he makes these super queer movies that are also like, yeah, somewhat explicit, not explicit. You know, this isn't shoving it down your throat like current woke culture. I but, uh, but he's gonna make you and... stare at a sweet man's butt and not show you <laughs> yeah. any but i also think that hellraiser is like deeply about horny heterosexual people you know like it's oh, about yeah. it's about a heterosexual couple that is like we need to find we bring you. back bring back yeah. my fucking adultery it makes it yeah i mean so not I to, fuck him once more not to like <laughs> hone too much in on on hellraiser but it, like it also makes those relationships seem deeply unhealthy and strange and twisted <laughs> and fucked up right like oh sure i mean that yeah the the frank putting on the dad skin uh, yeah. to uh, to uh, being like in love with his daughter. Like, yeah, that's like an uncle daughter incest. I don't know if I would call it in love so much as I would say just a horrible rapist. He's a, he's probably. Oh, yeah. Person. Well, I mean, listen, he recently escaped from hell. Yeah, uh, you can't. He's got hell PTSD. <laughs> That's true. Was Remember when that hell? one monster no. put natural human uh, blood on her titty like this? She did that one with the blood. That was pretty great. That's the other thing. Uh, it's like I yeah, don't the, remember. The, the, I actually don't remember. The heterosexuality in this movie is is uh, gross, <laughs> scary. Mm. The gay stuff is good. I, I'm I'm okay with just looking at a guy's butt as he goes up the stairs. That's nice. Mm. That, sure. I will say that blood. that the real bear butt was only in the ultimate cut. Oh, I, I did make no. Well, then that. I changed what I said earlier. I recommend. <laughs> I recommend it. I can give you the time code. So, after Decker uh, defeats our boy, or sorry, after <clears throat> Cabal defeats our boy Decker, we sort of get Midian is destroyed. Uh, Boone founds to find a new sanctuary for the night breed. And the film ends with Brood and Laurie sort of looking forward to a new future together while the remaining uh, Nightbreed characters are like in a barn waiting for their messiah, mm -hmm. which I thought was like, all of this last like 10 minutes of the movie is like, this is all sequel bait. Yeah. It's setting up yeah. A and also is brutal because you're like, well, how far did that giant group of Nightbreed go? Because like, yeah. like in our cut and probably your cut, it has the ending with Cabal turning Lori into Nightbreed, right? Uh, yeah. To yeah. save her, uh, which is also awesome on her part, where she's like, "Oops, I, I fucking killed myself. I guess you got to change me into Nightbreed." That yeah. kind of rules. And again, yeah, she kind of has agency. She's kind of not uh, a, a, like a lady around, but again, it's all it just fits outside the usual narrative. Well, uh, he, he, she's like, he's like, yeah, I'll come back for you, obviously. And she's like, yeah, when I'm 90 and I'm like, yeah, I do like that too. Which is like, same. you're immortal. And I just watched you, you take a knife through the chest and yeah. then kill the final monster yeah. with the knife through your and chest. And then like, be like, hey, hold this. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> he's got the yeah. ace. And, and when he had the little ace card on his, on yeah. his stomach, I was like, ace up your sleeve. I like uh, the symbology. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's interesting. But you are also like, well, wait, why? they don't quite establish why they have to be apart because it's like, well, certainly you're in walking distance of that bar because none of these guys, they do mention flying and turning into mist and stuff, but we never see it. No. Yeah. So uh, it's very odd. I wonder what her nightbreed powers are. We know what his nightbreed powers are. He gets real strong. <laughs> I guess. I was worried that she was going to come back as one of the really horrible monsters, and he's like, ugh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> She's the fat guy whose face is in his belly. Yeah. Or she just has, like, boobs on the side of her face. <laughs> like, all mm -hmm. the way going all the way down. And I feel like... Knees. 
I feel like Cabal would be like, well, I'm into it. it. I just got yeah. cool face tattoos, but you got 45 more. Uh, listen, I kind of got a dream thing with this porcupine lady. I'm not sure she's got quills on her pussy, so I'm, I'm going <laughs> to check it out. I'm going to try. I, you know, again, would be more interesting. I would love to see a weird situation where he's torn between yeah. her and, and the, this is also i do think though where like clive barker's books at least what i've dealt with are so sexual and i think he just yeah, knew yeah. that he couldn't get away with it and he just doesn't have that but but it's like that is actually missing part of what is interesting in his narratives as they are often dealing with sex and touching on sex yeah and i know but at the same time i do know that he uh <laughs> yeah thank you uh <laughs> um I do know that he like approved that last Hellraiser movie, which did have some slightly more edgy stuff, but was actually not that sexual. So I don't know. I think it's like what you said before is like, he knows what he can get away with. And maybe like in his old age, he's kind of like, yeah, I don't need to do it as much as I used to. Cause it was, it's not as provocative anymore when you got skibbity toilets and you know, people falling <laughs> over and asking for a dap up or yeah. whatever and saying no cap. Yeah, after they... up, no cap. <laughs> yeah. Is Midian in here, Cap or no Cap? Yeah. I've fallen and broke my ribs. Help me! <laughs> can we get can we get another thumbs down from Jesse in the chat? That's all I care about. Yeah. I've fallen. Um, help I me! I've here. rizzed and I can't get it up. I've rizzed and I can't get it up. I have a note here from. Uh, oh my god. Real feel, real feels is still here. Real feel, uh, yeah. I, 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 you ABC are, you are, uh, of the evening. You are a Baphomet strongest soldier. Really, yeah. Yeah. You I have, hope, you yeah. are. I hope you're at work or playing a video game or something. <laughs> yeah, uh, he's the true messiah. He's gonna lead yeah, us to the you new are Meridian. Cabal. Yeah. Um, there is a note that AI gave me here that says, in a final twist, Decker is resurrected by one of the Nightbird's former enemies, setting up potential future conflicts. When was that? I don't I think really... That, I think that is only in the ultimate cut. It is it happens. the priest. Also, the, the priest, priest resurrects him with the blood of Baphomet. But pl- yeah, and uh, oh, okay. the priest also kills the cop. I don't know if we... Yeah, so I have that, because the last time we see the cop... The black he's... cop? Tana- Panaka? No, no, the uh, the no, sheriff. the Michael Rooker oh, yeah. style cop. I did that, I that up. happened in our cut. Okay, he, he kills uh, Rooker, yeah, yeah. He throws it like he's Rooker in like... that moment, also is like, I want to be one too. Like, he, he yeah. decides yes. he wants to be yes. nice read, yeah, and he Which goes, Too bad, bitch. yeah, that's exactly what he says. He says, God yeah. says you're a bitch. He goes, so- I love dark meat, like Friday. <laughs> yeah. Oh no! And then Kelly Boylan calls him the Upsler. It's all, he says, it's all, he says "You'll no longer people. be known as the sheriff. You'll be known as D's." And he's like, "D's," and he says, "D's nuts." And then he crushes yeah. his throat. His eyes <laughs> pop out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Well, uh, we did it. The new format seems to work. Uh, thanks, <laughs> GPT. Um, I think that I've covered. I, I will say, in my work, I have found that GPT is especially terrible at summarizing movies. Just as a warning. It, no, it I, I have the next couple of movies like like out, and they're all kind of like what I did tonight. And okay. I think this was the best flow so far that I've. That Do you guys think that David done. Cronenberg would be back? to do this if if we, <laughs> we ask him. Uh, the man is in his 80s but yes <laughs> i don't know he likes I, I i don't know he used to love showing up as a as a guest he loved showing up as a guest star enough he read my fourth year student film which oh. had him as kind of a coach, so you know him coach mcgurk character no my my producer knew his daughter and he read it and said no <laughs> but uh, i would he read it i would settle it. for david it. cronenberg's daughter to come onto the show we're not talking Caitlin about Cronenberg, Cronenberg, she Cronenberg just had a new right now. Yeah. no Caitlin just had a new movie it, it looked good it had uh Enrique and Col- and Tony it was the one where like uh the government pays you to kill yourself but then the parents oh, right, yeah, yeah. runs oh, away yeah it looks good son of Cronenberg also yeah I Brandon really also good, good. good he it. also has a son with an earlier wife made a movie called Rhin- rhinoceros eyes it's pretty good Gestenberg. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god if you could get an all Cronenberg month 
Maybe he would he go could, on. I just, just to like message. say five minutes of like, hello, this is David Cronenberg. Uh, yes, I was in Nightbreed. Yeah. I Good am night. Nightbreed. <laughs> hello, Good this night is David breed. Cronenberg. Please stop calling me. <laughs> <laughs> just a phone message. Uh, I will read the, the poem you wrote me. It's yeah. Good And night I will breed. say, night please breed buy the NPC cuck dildos at the, hey, have you seen this one store? And uh, Gabba Gabba Hey or whatever. Uh, okay yeah, so, oh baba booey that's what i want to thank you thank you jason it was we've, <laughs> we've cut co- we've covered the movie uh we were in at time which is great um i like i was just kind of saying i think i've i've finished all my notes for the most part priest gets jazzed on and becomes a monster i guess mm-hmm. uh shot of midian on fire cabal has work to do but leah wants to go blah 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 they she dies yeah um i'm at in my notes i'm pretty much like home alone of it all i think yeah i mean i i like i i'm pretty close to being done yeah the only notes I have if is you like, guys have any additional notes. Would, would any cop ever believe Cronenberg? <laughs> like it does feel like yeah. his his plan is so bad. Uh, oh, and... especially the like he's got a gun and jumps out of the way. Oh, I do. I do think it. cops would believe that. I mean, that's... I do also believe that. Yeah. All <laughs> that that is, is, uh, up. He's like, I, sorry, my hands are clearly yeah. empty. <laughs> sorry to the law enforcement in the chat, but uh, <laughs> I do believe you, <laughs> you don't even do need that, to yeah. do the amount of theater he did. He probably could have just jumped in. Yeah, he probably could have just gotten out of the car and gone, he's got a gun. Um, <laughs> All of that is sort of theory corner, theory corner uh, coded. Sorry, I don't want to, yeah, I don't want to get too deep in the, north of Ask- Athabasca, east of Peace River is where you can find Midian. Uh, I just like it. No, I mean, you guys have the, the drops. That's true. Yeah. We like to drop it. Uh, speaking of which, do you want to talk about our uh, our Home Alone of it all? If you had to pick one, well, what do you think the Home, Alone is the Home Alone of it all? Can someone please tell me when the Home Alone? I really got to know when is the Home Alone of it all? What is the Home Alone of it all? Now that's the Home Alone of it all. It is weird that we have a Christmas song in every episode. <laughs> it's true. It used to be just that great Home Alone theme, but I was just no more copyright strikes from from Russia. YouTube. <laughs> yeah, from Russia. I just it just <laughs> drives me nuts. Home Alone music on yeah. YouTube in Russia. Home leaves <laughs> alone leaves you at home. Or... <laughs> yes, perfect. <laughs> Um, the, the rules are simple. It's not, there's no rules. Basically in the film, uh, adaptation of the book home alone. Nope. Uh, when Kevin McAllister slaps down the blueprint, (laughs) is this AI? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I'm reading this directly from AI. No, uh, basically in in the movie home alone, the, the, the part we're all there to see is how Kevin McAllister destroys his opponents, uh, with horrible traps. Mm. Uh, but really the conceit of that idea that I sort of came up with is that every movie sort of has that moment that you're sort of there for, you know, you're there to see Uh, over the years. Now we've sort of posited that it's, it's sort of the, the beginning of the cool part of the movie. It could be the trailer moment or even just sometimes it's the third act, you know? Um, But uh, what, why you shake your head? No. In this movie, it's the 15th act. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. Um, but with that, and you've done this before, Cam. Since I have. always goes first, what, what's your home alone, home alone of it all for this movie? You guys are monsters making the guests go first. For yeah. Uh, well, first, let me say, <laughs> I feel like I'm at Outback Steakhouse because it's no rules, just right. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> I do think the home alone of it all, in spite of there's a few home alone of home alone of it all. Agreed. As uh, I would say that it is when the cops attack Midian. Like, you do just want to see all these guys off the leash. And maybe even, as much as I think the behemoths are stupid, you're, once they mention... Oh, yeah. Once they mention, let's release those berserkers, you're like, yeah. I want to see them out. Yeah. Yeah. So it it is the fight, and I'm just seeing all the guys use their powers, and uh even what i would say maybe it even starts at the kind of prison break with the mom and, and uh, cut face narcisse doing their fun attacking cops 
Once cops start dying, I'm all in, baby. Like conversationally wise, I'll just go next because I it's the same. The siege on Midian is my home alone at all. But I did make a note very early in my notes that the second he fucking like starts tripping out and starts seeing all kinds of crazy shit, that was it. But I think that this movie excels when it, it makes the most sense when the cops are like, we hate those nap breed. Let's drive as fast as we can in a four car row down yeah. this down this country street and kill them all and crash our Jeep right into Midian itself. Yeah. And I do think it, it sets up the like, you know, <laughs> what if humans find Midian? And almost immediately it's like, humans fucking found Midian. They're coming to kill you. <laughs> They're here yeah. already. Yeah. Uh -huh. How about you, Steve? Um, you know, I, I I do agree with you guys that that is when the movie really gets going. But for me, you also not, watched a three and a half hour version. Yeah, yeah. Not, so the, it might not, be a little bit for more, me, more nuanced. For me, the movie never got. Going. Yeah, there isn't one. It it's for me the Home Alone of us all is when I went to bed after yeah. watching. This. For uh, me, it was being home alone, just being home alone the, the whole like time. A, ultimate um, cabal. Uh, for me, um. I'll, I'll go with the first time I watched the movie because I didn't know anything about it. I didn't even really look mm. into it before Cam, you had recommended it to me. Mm. So for me, the moment that the home alone started was the moment that he cuts his face off and he, st yeah. he starts talking yeah. about Meridian and he's like, I'm, I need to get back there. And that's when you start to realize that like Meridian is real. It exists outside of the confines of this graveyard. It exists in your hospitals. It exists in the streets around you. And it, it starts to unlock the the mysteries of the movie for me. And it, it made it far more intriguing. And I, I got that's when I started to get, really get into it. I, I felt it kind of difficult. Even seeing uh, Paula Quinn and Moonhead, I, I wasn't st I was still was kind of like, OK, I like yeah. these guys. They're interesting and cool. But that's the moment where I was like, oh, it exists outside of this place as well. And uh that's when the lore of the of the world that was being created kind of got to me, and I was like, "I'm I'm now I'm sold. I'm I'm home alone in it all right now." I'm, I'm no, I, I feel that, and I, and I would also say that I am almost. If I think back to like the first time I ever saw it, it's the Cronenberg killing the family, where you're just like, yeah. "Okay, there's a serial killer. There's a guy. What is even like even before the monsters? I think yeah. that you just want to, and it's building up of this showdown. It's doing the like." reacher thing of like right. yeah wait till cabal on this mask kills kills button eyes yeah, i want to see button eyes if, if that sequence where he's killing the family is three and a half minutes long i could probably <laughs> put duality to it i push my fingers into my eyes and it might be the perfect slipknot video you know? <laughs> honestly <laughs> based on those masks you showed me of slipknot yeah slipknot didn't do it they're well they're in I, I do I also that... like I wanted to say about that scene where he's cutting his face off because we didn't really talk about it. Get mm. this out of here. <laughs> Sorry. Um, when what? He this off, guys. Yeah. Got when he pulls off on. his face, you see the sort of like lizard skin underneath, right? Like this weird monster skin underneath it. And that is mysterious on its own. And nobody is really commenting on it. The doctors, the nurses, they're just kind of like, he cut his own face off or they thought that he did it. I guess. Yeah. And, and Cronin, this is another one where it seems. I thought like it was meant to be muscle, like the. Oh you know, uh, yeah, but no, there's some sort of monster face. It underneath. looks like a monster, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. got like scaly. Uh, I also feel like that's the interesting thing where I don't know if your cut had. It seems like there's a drop scene where Cronenberg is particularly cruel to him, and because he yeah comes he goes back in for him. and yeah he he goes in and he's like there's a, a long moment where they're like well, what are we going to do? And he's like, well, I can talk to him, but I'm going to need privacy or whatever. And he mm. goes in and like closes the blinds and you can, you can hear him doing stuff. You don't really see it. Um, but you get the idea that later on, there's a, a, a piece of dialogue where he's like, you, you made me say things that yeah. I never would have said yeah, yeah, yeah. had you not made me do it. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's the moment where the movie started to kick off for me. No, I think that's that that is a very good one too. I I want to shout out just so I don't forget as well. I think an equal thing when we were talking about like authors who aren't adapted well, and uh, uh, my apologies to as many victims. Uh, Neil Gaiman's Neverwhere. There's a TV show uh, that is the kind of the same. 
where I'm always like, somebody remake this, somebody make a movie of this. Never wear the one with the like mysterious uh, doorways to a different dimension. Yes, you where essentially you're like you're you like homeless a million years ago, and yeah. you're trying to and like once it's like you, pretty punk. Yeah, and once you commit to being part of that society, you're like invisible to regular life. Yes, yeah, I read but that. There, book. But there's like yeah. pursuant, and so that's when he like I think he maybe did a radio show first, did a book, and there's a TV show that is pretty good and like kind of full of like game of thrones people that you would be kind of into but looks cheap doesn't quite do it but again it's like a world that you're like i can't that is like a world i can't get out of my head i can't Mm -hmm. stop thinking about somebody should redo this it's so good i read american gods and then i read that like when i was like Mm -hmm. 22 you know so i was like this is affecting my whole reality yeah I watched Zeitgeist around that time. Remember the movie sure. Zeitgeist? Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it my door. Yeah. It's all the way down, man. Yeah. Another one. Did you ever watch Gorman Gast? That weird I, one. Yeah, I watched yeah, Gorman Gast. Yeah. 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 It's, it's like also more... like a yeah, where you're just like, I'm gonna show you the tiny corner of a fantasy world where you're like, ah, I want to know everything. What are you doing? Yeah. Show me more. I mean, God damn her. God damn! Uh, fucking J.K. Rowling, she did she did it well too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I want to know more about those fucking dead. Uh, you know, what about Ascaria, Cam? No, elves. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, Ascaria is a book that's coming out. I've learned enough. Or in twenty, I've learned enough. I'm, I'm tired of Ascaria now. No, I just played uh, Callisto Effect and was like, oh, this is a real Steve game. Yeah, I, I started playing it as well. It, it's it's dead space but it's not starting as uh yeah. in, it, it's starting a little bit too in it's your face for me. extremely <laughs> generic i will yeah. say it, it, did, it does not come up with much new but i was speaking like, of hey. games do you guys want to play a game do you want to play a game oh my god a game are you talking about the game i am it's time to play guess the mpaa Hello, everybody. My name is Jack Nightbreed, and I'm here to tell you about a new hit game that everybody's playing around the world. The rules are simple. Each and every day, a movie is given an MPAA certificate rating, which indicates what its uh, rating is between G-rated and NC-17. But don't worry, that's irrelevant. On this game show, there's a five-digit number. Concur. Two of those numbers I'm going to give you. All you have to do is tell me what the next three digits are between 000 and 999. Mkar. Uh, we've changed Why the Why have you adapted this? Okay. Like, affectation <laughs> tier. The, I don't know. James just really loved those recent South Park specials that are <laughs> Jack Nightbreed does specifically trying to mur- mur- no, murder not, Kathleen yeah. Kennedy. It's not Jason. It's Jack Nightbreed. Oh yeah, I forgot. Jack Nightbreed, Mr. Mackey. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Cam, since the last time you were on the show, the rules have changed slightly. Before I don't even remember the rules of this originally, so don't worry. Before I would you go get back one and forth twice. Did you do last time? <laughs> yes, last week. Uh, because we added that, Steve got it correct. He's the only person. Never that's that correct. insane <laughs> probably yeah. 30 episodes of us doing this yeah so basically this week also inconsequential the first two digits are three zero but cam okay. as the guest you go first give us a, a number between zero 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 and nine 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 i'll tell you if it's higher or lower uh three zero five six two no oh that's making it more complicated. You're making five, it more complicated. Five, six, two. Uh, lower. It is lower than that. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to go with 300. So 30300? Zero, three, zero, zero. Yeah. Lower. <laughs> uh, 30248. Zero, zero, lower. 30. 199. Cam, for your final guess, lower. 30. Zero. Zero, 069, my brother. <laughs> Steve Heyer. 30. 121. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> 
I can't play the I can't play the song the Can we get another thumbs down in the chat? <laughs> Did you hear Jennifer the first? <laughs> Just a little preview. Uh, this is what it used to sound like. Sorry. Oh, I stopped it immediately. Stop doing that to me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Real Phils. Thank this, you, Real Phils. You're your best fan. <laughs> uh, Real you, y'all, sh- y'all, y'all should give this person whatever they want. Yeah, you can have whatever you want. I hope they, they come they back for why, another show. Uh, why Pinhead hated the, the, the Nightbreed. They knew everything. I want to know guys, why this person, you know that, apropos of I, nothing, just down. That just it's Jesse. Down it's we were, oh. talking, we we're talking about Skibbity Toilet. I think he right. did. Yeah. I tried to go to into another thumbs down, and he didn't do it. So Uh-oh. maybe he didn't want to because he liked what we were saying. Yeah, uh, he was probably like <laughs> not enough Skibbity. Toilet. On principle, I cannot give that a thumbs down. That's probably it. Hey, Steve, why don't you hit us with uh, the final thought sound? It's time for our final thoughts i don't know it's fucking late hit us with your final thoughts um no the the just final thoughts uh guest goes first but uh if you have like a rating if you want to do as well that's perfectly welcomed yeah yeah i mean i i can do it uh pretty easily because i did a letterbox i'm uh i think i'm just myself on letterbox cam Allen. Uh, I said, it's not three. time for plugs yet. Sorry, <laughs> no, I got other plugs. I'm doing personal plugs. Uh, I, yeah, I, I did three out of five because I do think it's like I think that, that you should probably watch this. It's good. I do think the director's cut is better than what was before. I know it's like <laughs> it's nonsense, no matter cut you watch, but if you <laughs> throw it up on Tubi, I think you might get inspired and excited. And, and yeah, like I do think that there is this weird thing. Maybe I'm just fucking old millennial pilled and I'm like, this is good. Uh, but, you know, I'll bring in my 21 year old Gen Z girlfriend, Jen Alpha. We'll talk about it. Uh, we'll see how it is. Age is gap. Right? Age gap discourse. <laughs> Thigh gap, more like. Well, uh, no, no right. thank you. Okay. I want whatever the opposite of that is. It's just night, uh, night breed. What I want is night, night breed. breed. Yeah, yeah. Porky Thank you. My, my Thank hinge you. is specifically set to Midian. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. I got this to you. I like the idea of a dating app like <laughs> Midian is your choice. Yeah. I only want night bread. Yeah. All right. Steve, what what are your final thoughts for the hit film Nightbreed? Also, how have we gone three hours and two minutes in that gun? Working on my night <laughs> moves. Yeah, I put that all over social media today. Okay, good. Thank That's you, Jason. The song I used for all the time. Sorry, the... sorry to uh listen. I was I... there with you all day. Okay, good. Thank you. I think uh, for a movie about a fantasy world where people uh, who dictate the rules of a society uh, are the real monsters, you know, mm-hmm. which is basically just this movie uh, and the acceptance of everyone, you know, anyone who feels othered and different is, is like what we crave as an audience. It's compelling, but I think, like we said, the world building is where it's at in this movie. And even if you just want to sit back and look at what you're being fed and imagine what could be. I think that's a fun exercise as, you know, people who, you know, the three of us watch movies all the time, probably multiple movies a week, if not a day, some of us. And uh, that's a very fun part of of movie watching, especially when you're in the fantasy and sci- science fiction and horror realms is imagining stuff. And that's one of the, the most fun bits of watching movies that I experience. And this one does it for me. Even though it doesn't make sense, even though you could you could even call it bad <laughs> at points, I have a lot of fun watching this every time I watch it, even when I'm watching the three and a half hour version. Uh, I didn't hate watching it. Would I recommend watching it? The <laughs> answer is no. Uh, I would say watch the, the director's cut. I think that's a really clean version between the Cabal cut and the ultimate cabal cut. And I've never seen the theatrical cut, so I can't speak to that, but it's, there's no reason to watch it. Honestly, it's yeah. 
yeah, I think that the the director's cut is is where is a happy medium between everything. A happy median between everything. Oh my god. <laughs> um. Yeah, I I think it's good, and if I had to give it a rating, I would give it uh, not cutting your entire face off, but just cutting all the bits around your face <laughs> off. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> also, thanks, Real Feels. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I, I don't want a meta game here, but Real Feels and I just followed each other in Letterbox. So, Whoa. oh my god, Fuck wow, that's you, a deep cut. Can you guys follow me too? <laughs> yeah, follow me as well. I haven't updated in a while. Anyway, you gotta um, say what your username is, y'all. That's true. I think I it's like it it's probably hated. You. I think I put hated to see this one, but like it doesn't. Hmm. Mine's Boba Blackfly, like B O B A Blackfly. Hey, you, yeah. I bet you guys don't even have pro accounts. No, no, I know. Why would I spend money? I'm not a pro. Oh, amateur. You, fa- you found me on there? Oh my gosh. Oh my <laughs> goodness. Oh my damn. Thank you. I'll follow you back. I'm going to go back. I, I have so uh, real feels. If you follow me on Instagram uh, at uh, Spider Hero uh, 9000, I think. I review movies there like separately from all this, uh, which brings me to my review of this movie. I wrote a whole thing. I usually don't have a lot to say when I do this part. Like usually I wing it and but, oh man, I had a lot to say. I think this is a good movie and has a lot of good ideas. I can almost guarantee the book is better though. There are four versions of this, which indicates there are a lot of ideas being left out of the version I watched. And in here, I made a note, maybe reference stuff we all talked about as far as what was left out. And I think we kind of covered that with Steve watching the ultimate cabal cut, Mm. Cam being familiar with the book and the the comic books. I think we covered a lot of ground here tonight. The version I watched was a fine film and tells the story in a way that makes sense. It almost feels like a superhero or a fantasy story, which is fine. I feel it felt a little disjointed at the start and doesn't give a whole lot of meaningful setup that is paid off and it rushes into the story. But I think this is okay for like what this thing is. Um, And then I stopped that idea right there and talk about how I liked the score a lot. (laughs) Danny Elfman did Beetlejuice and Batman at the same time. I really enjoyed seeing the large amount of monsters in the movie. Uh, is all practical a remake of this with a more clear vision would be greatly appreciated i think it sets up a sequel that never came and wonder what uh, the book covers as far as that goes i also gave this a three out of five interesting cam the 3.5 hour cut is probably unnecessary which i wrote even before i heard steve talk about it um and then I give this movie a uh, Cabal from Nightbreed versus a Cabal from Mortal Kombat <laughs> in the Land of the Espers stage from Final Fantasy VI. At least one person got each one of those references somewhere. And a I, few got all three. I forgot to do a funny... I, uh, I forgot to say nine... Nine breeds at a night or whatever. <laughs> ah, that's good. I like it. I read this as Mortal Kombat. <laughs> <Yeah>. Mortal Kombat? <laughs> In this economy? In this economy. Um, so I guess that's the show tonight. Uh what a great show. Uh yeah, what, it was fun what, to a lot of weird movie with you guys. Yeah, I well, liked that we had stuff to talk about this time, unlike last time where we were like, uh, should we just but, but also <laughs> the next time, number one, no fucking Craig Schaefer. Number two, let, let's maybe do a good one. <laughs> yeah, go back and watch our Fire in the Sky episode where we struggle for less than two hours to talk about it. And a movie that I also think deeply affected my childhood and my brain. But And yeah. also Cabal is in that movie. Yes. <laughs> He's he's the fire in the sky. 
Oh, wait, he's no, he Johnny Fire. No, he's, he's like fire, fire in our like brother. He's like fire. He drinks a lot of fire water. Is that okay to say? No, I don't know. No, it's no, not. No, 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 no. Um, but just before we get out of here, Cam, tell us about things that you have coming up, going on. What are your plugs? What are you plugging? Yeah, I mean, I have a whole lot. I, I work, if you're in Canada, I work for the uh, Canadian TV channel, Hollywood Suite. We are available on cable and on demand on Prime Video. If you're not in Canada, uh, just because I know the only person who may be listening is Real Fields Podcast in Bakersfield, California. If you go to hollywoodsuite.ca slash originals, you can see a lot of the uh, content we create. My my main job, which is uh, documentaries about film history and both showing pop culture and, and film and how they relate to one another. And uh, we also have a, a podcast, which unfortunately we lost all our grants to. The granting system changed, but uh, we did, yeah, about five years of a podcast where we talked about, uh, you know, the weird trends in popular culture. What 70s year was like, hey, here's a bunch of trucker movies. What 70s year was like, hey, here's, you know, whatever. Uh, we we kind of got into all of it and how pop culture and film talk to each other. That's a lot of what my job is. So, yeah, Hollywood Suite, a year in film, both uh, in video and podcast form. Uh, and you can find Hollywood Suite, S U I T E E. Uh, no E. I don't know. I fucked it up. But uh, it's on every platform. Uh, and my cool skibbity toilet Gen Z co worker does all our TikToks. So. <laughs> and I like each and every one of them. They're fun. She, I, I, she gets it. She gets it. Thank you, Cam. Uh, I appreciate you taking this uh, ridiculous amount of time to talk about a ridiculous movie. Uh, you... Listen, I, I regretted it, but also love you guys. And uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe we oh, uh, we found in our... I've had many failed podcasts. And we used to find that when a movie was actually really good, it was tougher to talk about. So We, yeah. I, we both can identify yeah. with that. Our best content comes from when we rip a movie apart, but this was that fine that fine line where we liked it, but yeah, you know, some, something, something is good in there, but it's fucked up. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, we all agree we want to see a miniseries. At the very I want to yeah. watch. I would watch the shit out of a ten part. Are you listening? Minute. FX on Hulu. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Steve, what do you got boiling up in the old on the old Proctor pot? The fuck is a Proctor pot? Well, I'm slowly infecting YouTube as a voice actor. If you guys uh, mm. want to check any of my workouts, uh, Arcane Archives, uh, Doctor O, and Darth Theorist is probably the most predominant. Um, I am doing tons of that right now, but you can also follow me on. Um, pretty much all social media platforms at Boba Blackfly, B-O-B-A Blackfly. Uh, I'm an illustrator and a writer and a voice actor. I do it all. If you need anything, call me. Message me. I can do it for you. I promise. <laughs> a night breed, a night bread promise. I'll give, you, I'll give you some applause for that. <laughs> um, out of the three of us, I probably did the least amount. Uh, this is kind of my main thing here. Hey, did you see this one podcast? We go live each and every week on mainly Twitch uh, at 8 p.m. Eastern, but we also go live on a lot of different platforms. So if you're catching us here, you can catch us pretty much anywhere where you can stream live to. Um, other than that, uh, here in Toronto, I am a... Uh, I'm an announcer for a professional wrestling company. And you would think that would be like my main thing, but it's only once a month, you know, I, you know, so if you ever come to Toronto or if you live in Toronto, come check that out. It's usually, you know, third week of the month in the great hall on, on King. Uh, I don't know, man. We, we're basically also. three losers that prove that being a professional announcer is not a job that exists. Anymore. It's not a job that exists. No, I well. do it. Between us, we, we try to get every shitty. Yeah, we fight over nerd. all the jobs between the three of us. We're we're, we're yeah. deeply in. It's a living. Yeah. It's a living. And Fred Flintstone pulls on my fucking tail feathers yeah. again, and I don't destroy his face. Oh, so you're the week. you're the the alarm at the factory. Yes, uh, I always imagine disposal. myself as the, yeah the garbage disposal. <laughs> okay, right. I'll be the I don't know like a car wash. They fill you're the fax machine. Full of water, and I squirt it out <laughs> over the car or whatever. 
It's a living. It's a living. Um, but I would like to thank everybody who watched tonight. We had a like pretty big showing. Uh, it was a fun. It was a fun episode, and um. I think at this point I'll get the I'll get the last couple of videos here for us, Steve. But uh, I think that there's just one question that needs to be asked, Cam. What is it? Hey, did you see this one? I don't have the spooky version loaded up here. I don't think. <laughs> oh, that's why I was wondering what you were doing there. Yeah, I'm <sighs> sorry. Well, that happens. I uh, I was just checking my grinder, and someone says they want to night breed me. Do you guys know what that means? <laughs> Beam up some Star Trek content with Live Long and Podcast. Tune in to X Rated, the X Men animated review show. Artistic interviews with graphic histories. A roundtable movie discussion with Hey, Did You See This One? And movie reviews with Hold Up, a movie podcast. And while you're at it, spin a few records with Eamon on track. Watch us duke it out on trivial debates. And let's chat about TV with the Super Mater Brothers. It's all here on the United Federation of Podcasts. <laughs>